Welcome, everybody. Where you come? There he is. Thank you for coming today. Um, before we start, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tamika. I'm from Reptile Victoria. I'm a volunteer rescuer, snake catcher, and I'm also on the committee as the acting treasurer. Uh, we have Simon Wallery here today, who is the president of Reptile Victoria. He'll be our presenter tonight. And we have Steve O'Connor over here. He's a snake catcher in Bendigo, and he's helping us do a live stream. So tonight we're streaming all over the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the Goldfields region, the First Nations people of Bendigo, region known as the Jaja Wurrung community, the Jara people. Um, and I think we're ready to go with Dr. Chris, who works next door at the Bendigo Animal Hospital. So Dr. Chris um, is a veterinarian in Bendigo, and he helps us with all our reptile cases. So um, Dr. Chris will be presenting his slideshow soon as we get it up and running. And there we go. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right, I don't quite know where to stand. No, that's okay. Room, so I'll probably stand over here if that's all right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so before we start, uh, I am... Um, I don't know if I've, I've, met, I've met some of you before, I know that, um, but uh, yeah, I am a vet across the road. I, am, I have special interest in reptiles. I'm certainly not a reptile specialist. For any of you who have heard or met Shane Simpson, he is uh, a reptile god. Uh, I am just uh, I am just sort of a lowly, a lowly GP vet who's interest, interest in this kind of stuff. I also get the irony of a Scottish person lecturing to Australian people about snake bites. Um, so, Please uh, listen to what I say, but don't necessarily believe everything I say um, <laughs> when I go off the subject. So, um, I suppose what I'm going to do tonight is talk, you know, my, my area of expertise, snake bite first aid for pets. I'm obviously not going to talk about snake bite first aid for people. Um, most Australians know that far better than I do, but uh, these are the sort of thing that we see, depending on, you know, we, we have good years and bad years. Uh, um, I don't know how the other clinics in Bendigo have gone this year, but we certainly didn't see as many with the slightly cooler weather. Um, we, probably had maybe six or seven snake bites throughout the course of the year um, in, in cats and dogs. Uh, often we'll get sort of a dozen, 16 in, in a year. So uh, it's certainly something that, uh, they're not massive, massive numbers, but when it happens, it's just no one's ever ready for it. And I suppose we consistently see people making sometimes the same mistakes or, or certainly the same decisions in the, 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 in the moment. So, First things first, um, who are, oh, Hannah, first things first, get the slideshow to work. Um, there we go. Um, so as far as the main contenders within Victoria, um, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, um, but we have red belly black snakes, probably the, the least venomous, but uh, compared to just about any other country on the planet, still quite venomous. Um, we have tiger snakes. Again, probably they would be our, our second most commonly seen in venomation. Uh, and we have brown snakes. Um, this is an image that uh, one of our nurses put up on our Facebook last year, which I thought was quite interesting because every one of the snakes in that picture is a brown snake. Uh, and it's not always that easy to visually tell the difference. You know, if you're in the heat of the moment, if your dog's run into a bush and you've seen a snake slither off and you look at this sort of top left snake here, compared to a red belly black, compared to a tiger, it's not that easy to tell the difference always. Um, there are some localities of, of, uh, of snakes where the colors change as well. Some of the sort of like Chapel Island tiger snakes are quite dark in color if you happen to be over there with your dog or cat. Um, but uh, yeah, it's certainly something that, thanks to modern anti-venoms, which we'll talk a little bit about later on, uh, it doesn't massively matter. Um, identification, one thing I would say is don't worry about knowing what snake it is, just make sure that you're safe and, and your pet snake. Your pet, pet snake? Pet safe. <laughs> um, rule number one doesn't come as a surprise, I don't suppose, uh, but do not engage. Do not go in there and try to take on a snake because you will not do your pet any favours if you get bitten as well. So it's certainly something that, um, you know, we have experienced snake handlers in the room uh, and even these guys will know that it gets a little bit hairy sometimes, even if you really do know what you're doing and you have positive identification of, of the venomous snake. So very first thing, 
do not go in there. I've been in uh, Australia for six or seven years now. I'm yet to see someone who's been bitten by a snake at the same time as their pet, but I know vets who have seen it before. And, and thankfully, no fatalities in my experience, but don't go in there. Um, if your pet is taking on a snake, there is very little that you can do in the heat of the moment. So really, really common one that we hear is that people come in and they say, he's been bitten, he was in there and he had everything under control and then we tried to call him off and he turned around and that's when the snake got him. So I don't know how you control that situation, control yourself in that situation particularly, but it's certainly something that distracting animals can sometimes have a negative effect. So as much as it's sort of against every single fibre of your being, generally speaking, getting involved is not going to do them any favours. Like I said, if your pet's been bitten, you cannot help them if you get bitten too. So generally speaking, don't get involved. Um, the best thing you can possibly do, particularly with dogs, this is, and with cats, they couldn't care less. Well, if they're anything like my cats, they couldn't care less if you lived or died. So walking away won't convince them to join you. Um, but um, generally speaking, walking away as quickly as possible is advised. A, for your own sake, and B, once you get far enough away, generally speaking, your dog might pay attention and come and join you but at the very least by the time you get 50 meters away had a bit of time to think about things you can get back in there by that point normally the snake is dead or has disappeared and you can get a hold of your dog and, and start planning what your next step is uh, so <coughs> does that all make perfect sense thus far <laughs> yes um so as far as the venoms within victorian snakes we'll kind of group them all together. They're all fairly similar and um, different levels of, of different things, but um, they have two major effects. Uh, and, and in a way, we're kind of lucky because the two major effects are both completely fixable. Um, so they have a prothrombinase complex, which causes what's called a consumptive coagulopathy. So interestingly, a lot of people think they have uh, sort of anticoagulants in their venom, and it's actually the complete opposite. So they have a, 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 this prothrombinase in there basically clots everything in your blood at once and that means you run out of ways to clot your blood so they, they consume all the clotting factors so why that's interesting is it means that those dogs are more prone to bleeding very very quickly and more prone to bleeding for up to seven days after they've been bitten by the snake so um really nasty little toxin uh, but again one thankfully we, we can we can fix completely and um, accidentally move the, uh, the cursor haven't i Oh, good man, thank you. If you could, uh, yeah, whenever that happens, <laughs> cheers. Um, and the major ones are the neurotoxins. Um, so lots of different types of neurotoxins. They, they, um, it's a very quiet, clever science. People know what the names of all of them are, but essentially neurotoxins cause, cause flaccid paralysis. So flaccid paralysis is just weakness as we see it in, in real life. And, and that is essentially what kills a lot of these dogs. Dogs don't live long, dogs and cats, dogs don't live long enough for the, the, anti, the clotting problems to cause an issue because the, the, uh, the, the neurotoxins cause an issue long before they do. So they die of, of respiratory paralysis. They stop being able to move their chest to breathe. And so, as I said, um, signs of your pet's been envenomated. Anyone in the room had a pet be bitten by a snake? Yep. We're definitely in Australia. There's about four nods of the head there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredibly common. Um, so. What what did what did you see when, when it happened? Did you see anything? Uh, yeah, she, it, oh no! Okay, so unfortunately, that is that is one of the things that can happen is, is if you just don't have anything. Um, so uh, dog, both dogs were they? Yeah. Cat. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll go into cats a little bit. Um, but essentially, with dogs, really, really common one, and the the one that tricks you is that they will collapse. So they will go down. They're out on a walk. They stick their head in the bush. They will go down. And then they'll often get straight back up again. They can often sort of pee and poo themselves when they hit the deck, but they will get back up and act as if nothing's happened. So that's the one that catches people out. They think, oh, that was a bit weird, and they carry on with their walk. If you are out, if it's a warm day, if you're anywhere in Australia and your dog collapses on a walk and gets back up again, particularly if they're a young dog with no pre-existing health issues, we'll talk about what we do next. But basically, that is likely a sign of a potentially lethal envenomation. Um, I've moved again, sorry. <laughs> I need to stop waving my fingers away. <laughs> um, really, really common to not see any symptoms of the dog having been bitten externally. So uh, we very infrequently will, even by the time we finish treating that dog for three to five days, will not find the bite mark on them. So brown snake teeth, 
for anyone who's been fortunate or unfortunate enough to see the inside of a, a venomous snake's mouth. The teeth are quite small, and they don't have these big fangs that everyone thinks about, um, and though they're just like a pump, little needle puncture mark. Underneath hair, uh, it's something that you, you very rarely will see. Sometimes if they are sick enough, and particularly with, with red belly black bites, we get longer term clotting problems and we'll sometimes get oozing out of the original bite site and we'll find it that way, but you're very unlikely to be able to find it on the day. Um, even if you see them get bitten, you will probably not be able to find it. If they don't have that initial collapse, if you don't notice anything to start off with, the first threat sign that you're going to see is weakness or wobbliness on the legs once that venom starts to take effect. Um, cats are cats and therefore they're weird. Um, they can be similar to dogs, um, so we certainly had a few present uh, where they've, you know, the owners seen them with a brown snake in their mouth. That's a really common one is because they're generous. They bring brown snake into the living room and drop it on the floor. Uh, and uh, then they start to show all the symptoms of being bitten by a snake. So um, they can be similar to dogs, but I would say in, in my limited experience, that's probably rarer than what we tend to see, which is that we get this slow onset. Uh, so often over 24 to, to 36 hours, cats will slowly progress and slowly become uh, paralyzed. Uh, so weakness and um, sort of neurological symptoms are the kind of typical ones that we see. Um, how much time do you have? So, you know, this is a slide that I, I, I questioned whether to put in because um, it's not particularly helpful. The, the simple answer is if you see your snake, your pet get bit, bitten by a snake, take it through that as quickly as you possibly can. In dogs, 15 to 30 minutes is what we quote people. So if you are 45 minutes away from the vet, that doesn't mean give up all hope. It means drive carefully, but drive quickly. Um, so, uh, one of my um, predecessors at the clinic, um, in fact, I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, I was about to go off on a tangent there. I'm not going to do that right, not going to do that yet. Um, yeah, dogs, you really don't have much time. Um, so the, the venom is particularly, uh, they're particularly sensitive to the venom. Most dogs, if they have received a lethal envenomation from either a tiger or a brown snake, will not live past 60 minutes, but some do. So like I said, if you're in the middle of nowhere, um, it is absolutely worthwhile getting in the car. Uh, and we certainly have seen dogs where we've not been sure, and we've kind of two or three hours after they've come into the clinic, they've done a wee and it's had some blood in it, and that's one of the kind of classic symptoms, and we go, oh, hang on, I know what's going on here. So it does happen, so it's always worth trying. Um, in cats, like I said, symptoms can take hours to develop. Um, they'll often vomit shortly after being bitten. So if you happen to see your cat bring a snake onto the lawn and then they go away and they vomit somewhere, that's usually <laughs> kind of fairly accurate way of knowing that uh, they have been bitten. Uh, and like I said, in cats, because they're weird, um, symptoms can take as little as 15 minutes or as long as 24 hours. We tend to find in cats where they're very acutely affected, the chances of them surviving is, is relatively low. Uh, compared to, say, a dog that got in within the same amount of time, the ones that they, that normally is a sign of a really, really heavy envenomation. But we had one um, probably about two years ago now. Uh, it's one of those sort of gee whiz cases where I don't know if it's anything I did or just good luck. Um, but she actually died at the traffic lights on the corner of Napier Street there. And she stopped breathing. Her owner was an emergency critical care nurse. Um, so she went blue in her gums, stopped breathing, complete cardiac and respiratory arrest came into our clinic and it just so happened, very, very unusually, that three of our vets weren't doing anything at that particular moment in time. So one vet was on um, intubation, one vet was on resuscitation, and I, because I'm an old school farm vet, stabbed about half a mil of adrenaline straight into her heart and she started breathing again and she went home five days later. Um, so it, is, it was unbelievable. And uh, like I said, it's far more ass than class, I'm afraid, but um, it was, uh, these things can happen. So. Uh, I always say, I, I say it all the time, but I'm always amazed at the fact that uh, snake venom is uh, is designed to uh, kill small furry animals, and cats seem to be able to shake it off quite easily. And what to do? So if you're in your house, if you're out in the bush, if you're walking, get in your car and phone the nearest vet clinic. So this is a, a plea from a vet. Try not to turn up on the door of a vet practice with a dog that's been bitten by a snake. It takes a little bit of time to get things ready for you when you arrive. So we need to have nurses ready, we need to have vets ready, we need to make sure we shuffle things around. Uh, you will not get as high a standard of care if we don't know you're coming. You're still going to get a high standard of care, but we move heaven and earth to these guys because they are a genuine emergency. So 
phone the nearest vet clinic. It doesn't matter if it's not your normal vet clinic. Vets know that this is what happens. Um, if you're nearer to, you know, Spring Gully Vets than you are to Bendigo Animal Hospital, or if you're nearer to Frankston Vets, just phone whichever one you can find on Google um, and you get there as quickly as you can. So I've done that again. Um, if you're a considerable distance from the car and you're brave and fitter than me, uh, it may be helpful to carry your dog. Uh, so um, just like in human first aid with, with snake bites, the venom spreads through the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is driven by movement uh, and driven by your, your heart rate, driven by sort of, uh, it's passive. So the reason your legs swell up on a plane is because you're not moving around and your lymphatic is just your, your lymph fluid sits in your legs. So, um, if your dog is, you know, sort of uh, half a K from the car and your adrenaline's pumping, then carrying them may potentially be helpful. Um, again, it's never been proven. No one's ever done any tests on this, but the theory sort of uh, is there. Um, with cats, uh, they'll often be collapsed and hypothermic, so they'll have a low temperature. And um, when we catch these guys, sort of when they become symptomatic, we often get them into the clinic with temperatures of sort of 34 and 35 degrees Celsius. They shouldn't be below about 38. Uh, they wrap them up in a blanket um, and generally speaking put them in a carrier um, for when you arrive at the clinic because if you walk through the consulting room or a waiting room full of German shepherds and your cat's been bitten by a snake and it's wrapped in a blanket, all hell can break loose. Uh, again, thankfully I've never seen that, um, but uh, it's just a bit stressful for them, so cover them over and, and keep a very, very close eye on them. Um, drive within the law. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, so, uh, we th this this has a story behind it, which I was about to tell on the last slide. Uh, one of my predecessors at the clinic, uh, Lyndall, one night was on call and she got a phone call from a gentleman who was in Heathcote, uh, and he said, "My dog's been bitten by a snake." Um, and Lyndall said, "Okay, I'll meet you down at the clinic." Lyndall lived about five minutes away, so he arrived on the doorstep a worryingly short period of time later, uh, and um, two police cars came in behind him, uh, and uh, he handed the dog over to Lyndall, turned around and put his hands on the back of his head. Um, so it turned out he was a blue lights trained police officer, uh, and he'd gone through um, the center of Bendigo at 90 kilometers an hour. Um, so uh, he lost his license, and sadly he lost his dog as well. Um, so it was a really bad night for him, uh, but uh, yeah, don't, again, you're not gonna do your dog any favors if you end up wrapped around the tree. Um, so uh, drive carefully is the general advice. Um, be prepared for the vet clinic to move quickly. So this is a bit of a public service announcement on my own behalf. Uh, when you arrive at the vet clinic, the vets will talk to you about money. They will talk to you about how much it's gonna to cost to treat your pet. It's an awkward conversation to have. Um, it's one that I have to have, like I said, 12 times a year and it's one that it's awkward and we don't like having a conversation either, but um, snake bites are expensive to treat. We'll go into a little bit of detail about what, what treating a snake bite involves, but I always walk into the room, I apologize to people, I say, I'm really sorry that we have to have this conversation. Generally speaking, by that stage, the dog is through the back, getting intubated if it needs to be, getting an IV placed, so we don't delay anything because we have to talk about financials. Uh, we'll always start treatment regardless, but there is an expense involved in, in all of these things. So, um, vets are not just out to make money, but we, we need to sort of uh, receive compensation for what we do. So uh, they will have to have that conversation with you, and uh, we don't love it any more than you do, trust me. Um, what we do when you arrive. Um, so the first thing, like I said, we will place an IV line into any dog or cat that arrives, and we will start them on IV fluids. So in cats, Interestingly, not all cats will need anti-venom. So uh, uh, in, in my experience, I would say probably, in fact, the majority of cats don't need anti-venom, uh, anecdotally, off the top of my head. Um, the, the figures are out there as far as how many cats survive with anti-venom, but they're incredibly resistant to it and they can survive without. The gold standard, the sort of the, the thing that we would always suggest is they should have it, but it, with, with no anti-venom, what happens is they tend to be completely paralyzed. Uh, I'll show you a photo of a paralyzed cat in a second. Uh, but they just remain paralyzed for up to a week, and then they go home. Um, so uh, it's uh, great um, from a point of view that um, they, they don't die, obviously. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not so great when you have to blink for them for 48 hours because they're so paralyzed that they can't move their eyelids. So um, they, it's, it's certainly something that is, is fairly dramatic and fairly intensive, but 
these guys can do really well. Anti-venom is the next thing. So I brought, uh, very boringly, I brought a tube of anti-venom um, just because it's the big money knife and when we're feeding snake bites, it feels good to hand it around just to show it all the Does anyone know how anti-venom is made? From Sorry, from it is so venom's involved. Um, this is the, so it's the same. Yeah, this gentleman knows. <laughs> uh, do you want do you want to tell it, Ron? Uh, they get the horses and then they extract the antibody for the horse. Hundred percent. Yeah. So that's completely correct. So it's, I find that bizarre in this modern day and age that uh, that's how we get anti venom. You know, I would have thought it would have been a machine in lab that uh, sort of pops it out. But yeah, we inject snake venom, low doses of snake venom uh, into horses and or sheep, depending on the antivenom that's being produced, and we draw the antibodies from those horses. So the way that it works is when we give an injection of antivenom, those <laughs> antibodies will bind to the venoms and they will be peed out um, as an innocuous substance. So it means that any of the venom that's bound onto the muscles and the tissues already doesn't get picked up. It's only the free floating venom in the bloodstream. So if they're already unwell, then sometimes it doesn't work as well. So it works really well if you get them early, not as well if you get them later. Did you have a question? That's horse Horse, horse antibodies, so horse plasma, not pee. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the, the irony. Yeah, the irony of selling people horse pits for, for loads of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's horse plasma, essentially. So they, they take a big blood, because horses are big, it's easier to get large volumes of it, but essentially they draw big blood samples from these horses, spin it down, and take the, the, the animal. Does it hurt the horses? It's, it's not particularly, not any more than, than an injection would hurt you. Um, but yeah, I suppose that's always a question is, is you know, the welfare of why, why is this animal more important than this animal? It's exactly the same in human antivenoms, I believe. Um, so it's something that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, some, some, it's certainly, like I said, it's fairly archaic and medieval, but um, it's the best way we've got at the moment. Uh, uh, Chris, what about snake bites on large animals? Like, for example, horses, cattle, Ask me one on on, uh, on sport. Um, that's not my area of specialty, I'm afraid. Um, I have uh, Mike, uh, my, my friend up at the Equine Hospital, gets two or three snake bites in horses a year, uh, and they are particularly sensitive to the venom, as far as I know. So, um, where a full bite from a tiger snake might not kill a cat, it would very easily kill a horse. Um, that's my, my understanding. Um, but um, they're very hard to prove as well, because again, there's not often any symptoms, uh, there's not often any external signs. So, 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 yeah. No, 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 and, and in very and that's what the really interesting thing is, it depends on the animal's sensitivity to that thing. So botulism, for example, is, is sort of, uh, is a toxin that is very, very easily, uh, sorry, tetanus, not botulism, tetanus is something that very, very easily will affect horses, but birds are very resistant to it. So they can carry it and they can poo in a horse's stable and give that horse tetanus. So, um, same with, with reptiles in general, you know, they'll carry salmonella that will give us horrible diarrhea. So, um, the level of sensitivity, depending on the species, is completely unpredictable and variable. Um, but yeah, kangaroos, again, not something I, I've ever seen or, or known about. Uh, it's, it's really tough because if you find your horse deceased in the field, absolutely snake bites on the list, um, along with lightning strike and, and uh, various other sort of acute causes of death, sort of heart attack, um, uh, aortic rupture, and not all of them get post-mortemed. Uh, I, I don't know whether there'd be any obvious symptoms on post-mortem of the snake bite either because it happens so quickly, other than suffocation. Good question. Um, I will, I'll ask Mike tomorrow. He won't know either, I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, anti-venom, that, that is part of the reason that it is so expensive. So depending on the type of anti-venom, depending on the one that I've passed around there is, is a multivalent one. So it's got tiger and brown snake in it. If we don't know what's bitten a dog or a cat, we'll generally use the multivalent one because it covers all bases. Uh, if you bring in a brown snake with your cat, then we can use the more specific anti-venoms. Costs range depending on where you are in the country and depending on what type of anti-venom, anywhere from $400 to about $1,000 per bottle of anti-venom. Uh, and uh, a lot of the specialist centers are now advocating two bottles straight up um, to every animal that presents with a bite. So that's $2,000 before you've even started treating them. Um, so these things, like I said, can potentially be expensive. Sorry, Chris, why is it so expensive? Uh, because of the production methods that are required, if you you can only uh, blood sample those horses so often, and uh, so you need to have a large number of horses, you need to have a large 
uh, sort of uh, set up to, to get those samples from those horses. It's like us giving blood, you can only do it every three months, so you have to care for those horses 89 days out of 90, and then on one day they, they sort of they can give up a small amount of, of this anti-venom, so it's just very labour intensive, um, and therefore we get charged a lot for the anti-venom, and therefore we have to pass that on. Mm -hmm. so if they could produce it in the lab, I would imagine costs would come down considerably, uh, but at the moment, because of the way it's produced, it's, it is expensive. Chris, can I ask a question you yeah. probably don't know the answer to? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I was just wondering, if, when you've got the envenomation of the horse and you're creating antibodies mm -hmm. to, to take out the blood flow, um, how long is that antibody going to stay in the horse? Are you constantly having to re reenvenomate the horse? C correct, yes. So I, I believe they have to constantly give low doses. So it's, it's not like a we're in the middle of a vaccination storm at the moment, so it's not like a vaccination where you give it once and then that horse is immune for a long period of time. My specific knowledge on how frequently is, is not great, but I do know, we'll, we'll actually come back to it in one of the later slides, but your pet, one of the kind of common misconceptions is if your dog gets bitten by a snake and survives, it will then have immunity for a period of time. I've seen cats come in within two weeks of being bitten and they're envenomated again. So there's there's no sort of prolonged immunity as far as I know. But we've had we've got one cat in particular who's been in six times for snake bites. Uh, so his mum is really pleased with him, you can imagine every time she now comes in with a look on her face <laughs> that we use as a diagnostic tool. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, no no blood samples required on that particular cat. <laughs> All right, sorry. Um, as far as what we need to do, so if these dogs come in with sort of what we call pre-paralytic symptoms, then we'll very frequently get away with just giving them anti-venom and within an hour, they're actually doing much better and we don't have to have much in the way of intervention. Uh, they're obviously under very close monitoring. Whenever we have a snake bite come in, they get their own nurse assigned to them for the rest of the day. Uh, and uh, they, they basically sit with them constantly because these guys can go into respiratory arrest very, very quickly. So. Um, if they come in in the later stages, then, like I said, respiratory paralysis is the thing that will kill these guys. So theoretically, if you breathe for them, they will stay alive for as long as you can keep breathing for them. So we, we will ventilate them. We do have a ventilator, uh, but we also have some very committed nurses, um, and in particular one committed vet, Max, who sat with the dog for three hours, um, squeezing a bag to keep him breathing before he got up and got off the table um, and went home. So, um, it is something that if you put the work into these guys, you can get really good results. In cats, like I said, they will just lie like this for prolonged periods of time. Um, our nurses will lubricate their eyes seven to eight times a day uh, and roll them over so that they're not getting uh, increased risk of, of pneumonias. They just lie there and do nothing and they look like they're dead. Their temperatures will often run low for, for a few days as well, just because nothing is happening in their body. They're not generating any kind of heat by, by moving their muscles. Um, but, as I said, incredibly, they will often just get better. Chris, yeah. we had a case um, years ago um, in Custom Lane where, and we brought, brought the cat home, the cat home afterwards was a snake bite. Yep. Um, and it seemed to rally, and we thought it was going to survive, and then it went into full seizures and died. Yeah, okay. Unusual. Um, this is in the early days of snake bite. So, did it, did it have anti-venom? Did you give it anti Yeah, okay. So it could have been a delayed reaction. So because we're giving horse antibodies to animals that are not horses, uh, they can have anaphylactic reactions to these things. So this that, is about three that, days later. Oh, three days. So yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, we, we got it through to that stage. Yeah. And so we brought it home because it's weekend too. That's very unusual um, to have those kind of central neurological symptoms. And an anaphylaxis would normally happen. It can be delayed, but it would normally happen within the first 24 hours. Uh, I can't really think, so we, we certainly see if your cat is bitten by a snake, the, the snakes, like we said earlier, don't have any specific uh, anti-kidney sort of kidney or anti-heart or anti-brain toxins, but because of the shock that they cause, they can cause other organs to fail. So if your blood pressure drops sufficiently and you get hypoxia to any one organ, that's when we get kidney failure and things like that further down the line. So it's not because of the venom, it's because of the effects of the venom. So it may be some sort of... So subsequent issue because of the injury that was originally caused. And, but nothing I can think of would be caused by the, the venom or the anti venom. Excuse me, Chris. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions. What's the clearance time on the anti venom? 
in terms of how long does it last in their yeah, system? Yeah. A couple of hours maximum. So that's why they're talking about multiple um, vials. Uh, they're now seeing two vials as a one-off and potentially a subsequent vial after that. Uh, but because it, it binds and then is excreted renally, it's not excreted at one pass, uh, but uh, the half-life is, is, is an hour or something like that. Okay. And um, is it better analyzed in the liver? Uh, is, that, is that your phone laughing there? <laughs> uh, is it metabolized in the liver? Uh, no, it's excreted renally as far as I know, so it's an antibody. And I suppose if any of those antibodies did eventually reach your liver, I think your immune system would probably clear them up first because okay. they're, they're, a foreign, they're a foreign antibody. So yeah. they, that's as soon as we give them one of the major risks of giving antivenom. The reason in humans they don't just rush in and give you antivenom is because you can have a, an immune reaction to it. You can go into anaphylactic shock. So they always weigh up the pros and cons. You know, are you showing signs? Similar with animals and cats in particular. Uh, we usually would use antihistamines prior to giving them the antivenom. We used to use adrenaline and, and um, steroids, dexamethasone as well. We don't tend to do that nowadays um, because the steroids can have other effects in terms of the shock. So, um, yeah, it's certainly something that we, we tend to use antihistamines. And if we see any signs of temperature rises or increased heart rate or, or breathing difficulties, then we'll, we'll jump in with the, the more aggressive sort of anti anti um, allergic drugs. But yeah, it's certainly something I think, yeah, liver would not be one that I would think of um, particularly. Not an expert on that, I'm afraid. Yes. Hello. Um, you said we do the, like, the drug trial on the um, horses. We don't do it on the cats if they have such a big glass bed with uh, uh, anti venom. What, sorry? So, when you do the testing, can you do it on the cats as well? How come you don't do it? Like, sorry. Get the anti venom? Testing for what? Like the anti venom? You know how you test it on the. Oh, so that that does that's not necessarily because they have inbuilt immunity. It's just be, it's because of their physiology that they're resistant. I would also put it to you that anyone who's crazy enough to start up a cat farm for anti venom <laughs> is, is, is not someone I want to have a beer with. Um, so uh, it's it's definitely something that yeah I I, I get it, but it would be volume. Um, you know, a, a horse is is five six hundred kilos, and you can take three liters, you can take twenty liters of blood relatively easily. Whereas with cats, you can only take about zero point five percent body weight. So like sort of 300 mils max at a time, you need a lot of cats um, when there are already too many cats. As a cat owner and cat lover, there, there are too many cats. Um, um, anyone else? Sorry. No? Okay. Well, we, we can ask questions at the end if we want. Prognosis. So 80% of dogs, these numbers are from a study that was done up in Queensland uh, through about 12 different vet practices. 80% um, of dogs that receive antivenom will survive. Uh, and 91% of cats that receive antivenom will survive. Um, so that means your dog, uh, I, I, numbers like this, I think we're programmed to look at 80% and think that's pretty good, 91% is even better. That means one in five dogs don't make it uh, and about one in 10 cats don't make it. So those numbers, I like to make sure that people always look at the opposite um, because it doesn't mean that you know 90% is great. I mean, it's incredible really when you think about the amount of venom going into such a small animal, but um, these are potentially lethal, uh, and uh, this is with everything being done that these animals are surviving. Uh, as I said earlier, there are no lasting side effects with uh, successful treatment of envenomation, notwithstanding seizures three days later. Um, but um, it's something that, generally speaking, the, the, the effects would be secondary to the initial illness, not to the venom. Tiny little bit of myth busting, and then I promise I'm done. Um, Vitamin C does not treat snake bites. Um, anyone heard this? Yeah, anyone believe it? Yeah. Anyone tried it? Uh, so generally speaking, the, so vitamin C is an antioxidant. There is no specific way that it could potentially in any way block toxin, the toxins that are, are in uh, venom. The, I think the myth has been perpetuated because Occasionally, snakes will bite and they don't envenomate animals. And quite, in fact, quite frequently, snakes will bite animals and they don't inject any venom. Adult brown snakes, adult sort of uh, elaphids can choose whether to envenomate or not. Uh, so if your dog gets bitten, you would obviously assume that it's envenomated. If you then give it some vitamin C and it doesn't die, you assume that it's because of the vitamin C, <laughs> when actually it's probably because it was never envenomated in the first place. So, um, uh, some vets will still use vitamin C look, because it's an antioxidant. If you use it alongside antivenom and, and proper treatment, then I 
don't have any issue with it. Interestingly, another another really interesting fact is that we don't produce vitamin C naturally. We need to eat vitamin C because we can't make it ourselves. Dogs are perfectly capable of making all the vitamin C they need to make without getting supplemented with it. So there's no real need for it as far as I'm concerned. Pressure bandages, like we do in humans, bandage the area where you've been bitten. Uh, really good in theory. As I've already said, dogs are covered in hair. Very rarely do we see them where they've been bitten. So where are you going to pressure bandages, the answer is the question. The only time we do tend to see dogs getting bitten is when they've got a snake in their mouth and they're getting bitten on the head. Um, and if you can manage to pressure bandage a dog's head after it's been fighting the snake for 10 minutes, you're doing far better than I've ever done in the last 14 years. So um, it's something that good in theory, but by the time you've mucked around and done that, you're five minutes behind the eight ball. So I would suggest not worrying too much about that. Um, this is what we were just talking about. So anti-venom or surviving from a snake bite without anti-venom, that does not provide any ongoing immunity to being bitten by a snake. You will see stories of um, mad people in the States and, and uh, probably in Australia as well, um, who will inject themselves with venom or allow themselves to get bitten to develop oh, immunity. Uh, what's that, sorry? I think they're building up a tolerance. Yes, yeah, and, and actually there is some potential truth to it with repeated, uh, because you can, you can eventually convince your immune system to retain that immunity, but for the number of bites your dog or cat's likely to get in their lifetime, this is not going to be um, uh, useful. Sorry. Uh, and vets are not only interested in money, as I said earlier. Um, we really, really genuinely do want to fix your pets, uh, but we like to eat and pay our rent, um, so we need to be paid for things. Um, any questions? Um, so, about four weeks ago, um, our two dogs took on the ground tank. And we may have intervened and um, so does everyone got them away and then helped dispatch said snake, which was not looking good anyway. But we took the dogs to the vet and they had two tests done on them. Yes. Because of how emotional I was at the time, I really don't understand what those tests were. So the, usually the two tests will do, so there are two main things that uh, we look at. So because of those, thinking about those toxins, um, so one of the toxins was the prothrombinase complex, so clotting, blood clotting. Within 30 minutes of being bitten, your pet's clotting time will be affected. Um, so that's the kind of first and most sort of, I suppose, it's not very specific, as in it doesn't tell you that they've definitely been bitten by a snake. You know, if they happen to be a hemophiliac yesterday, then they might still um, have a blood clotting problem. But um, normally they'll do a clotting test to, to check. So that can be done in a number of ways, um, the sort of old fashioned way, um, which is the way that we still use our, what are called ACT tubes. So we put blood in a tube, shake it up, and we see how long it takes to clot in there. Uh, the more modern ways to look at um, two clotting factors, PT and APTT. And um, so I don't know whether that was the two tests, whether it was PT, APTT, or whether it was maybe they did an ACT. The other thing we can look at is a muscle enzyme called creatinine kinase. Um, was that so? CK. So um, your normal CK levels are anything less than 400 is normal. In a snake bite, they'll often be 15,000 plus. Um, so we'll often get these really spectacularly high levels. The problem with those is they can take up to two hours to go up. Um, so if you present half an hour later and we get a normal CK, it doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't definitely been bitten. But we'll often use it as a way to check further down the line that they're getting better. Um, so day one, we'll have a CK of 2,000, day two will often have 15,000, day three it's coming back down again. So um, I suppose when we get these guys presented initially, it's all about information gathering and, and the snake venom detection kits, which they use in human beings, they're sort of, uh, the useful thing about humans is they can tell you whether they've been bitten, um, dogs can't, uh, and they will quite happily pee into a cup so that you can check with the snake venom detection kit. In dogs, not always that easy to get them to pee, uh, and the snake venom detection kits are four or five hundred dollars as well. So, and um, we'll generally do those couple of tests, which will add up to not a million miles off that that price. But and um, we'll do those tests a bit, a bit faster to get an answer. Yeah. Did your dogs were they bitten? Yeah, no, they, yeah, one of them was covered in stuff. I don't know what. I, I, should, um, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, um, but no, they were fine. But. Probably took us 10 minutes by the time we got them inside, and I talked to the vet. And yeah. <clears throat> we decided, or I'll take them, and so then we had to get from Mandarin to um, yeah. Mackay Road. Yeah. Because um, it was 
always a Sunday. Always is, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and then they started the test straight away. So it probably would have been close to that half an hour mark. Yeah, yeah. But we just felt that by the time they started to show symptoms, because we were that far away, it could have been too late. 100%, yeah. yeah. I mean, Mandarang is, uh, yeah, that's sort of snake bite central, essentially. Um, so, yeah, we, yeah. A, lot, a, lot of, a lot of ours will come from out that direction. We keep yeah. the snake catchers in business. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the vets. Yeah, I know. Well, next time we decide if we'll drive to the vets, so we're close. And we'll just watch him in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, old, my old boss used to tell people when he was on call to drive to the clinic and wait in the car park. And if the dog looked better after 10 minutes of being stretched by going to the vets, then they could just go home and there was no charge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly something that, like I said, it's all about information gathering. And you don't have a lot of time. Your, your point there, um, I, I forgot to make that point as I was going through. If you happen to find your dog covered in blood uh, from after a snake bite, it's probably the snake's blood. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it would be very, very unusual for a snake bite to cause any bleeding at all in the first instance. So when we see dogs come in, it's normally that they've grabbed it and shaken it and got covered in blood and guts and everything like that. Yeah. All right. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Every second person overseas thinks everything that's not human in Australia bites, stings, kills. That's been my what, experience, actually. What, what, what <laughs> was your experience before and now? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I legitimately thought it was going to be like Crocodile Dundee when I came over here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like I said, depending on where you go, it wasn't a million miles off. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, my, my old boss um, was an American uh, and uh, his friends in America, you know, they sort of said to him, you must be mad living in Australia, it's full of deadly animals. <laughs> and his response is, so is America. It's just oh. they're all carrying handguns. Um, so <laughs> yeah, like I, I went to pick up my petrol car Canister in my garage the other day and found a black widow eating a huntsman on it, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm definitely in Australia." <laughs> um, it, it, you know, every every I, I come from the UK where wildlife doesn't have to try that hard because it's all green and lush, and uh, nothing's ever had to get highly venomous or, or very specialised in its field. Over here, because it's so dry and tough, and in general, you know, millions of years have forced these guys. There's just been a bit of an arms race, so. Yeah, I mean, even the kangaroos will get you. Um, it's uh, it's pretty pretty dangerous. Uh, but so, how did you jump the corner? How did you turn the corner then, from going from someone who thought everything was deadly? I've all I've always loved reptiles. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've reptiles since I was born, pretty much. I um, you know, I got my first snake when I was twelve years old. Uh, my um, I tell this story all the time. I've probably told you this story, but when I arrived in Australia for the first time, jumped in the taxi, sat down, and um, was driven to wherever where I was going to stay for for a while, and. Uh, the taxi driver said, where are you from? I'm from Scotland. Uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a vet. He said, oh, what kind of vet are you? I said, well, I, I, I'm a sort of, uh, I really like reptiles. Uh, and uh, he said, I said, uh, particularly snakes. You know, so I used to have 27 pet snakes when I was in the UK. And he, he said, well, you better be bloody good at stitching the heads back on then. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, that's the sort of Australian take on these guys. So a lot of misinformation, you know, they're, they're never out to get you. I, I completely understand when, you know, when they're in your house and they're threatening your children and your pets and everything, I totally get why people react the way they do. Um, and I potentially would do the same, but uh, it's, it's something that, I think education and understanding that they're not out to get you is, is really important. Have you ever lived in which someone's brought the same or we've been Very much so, yes. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, Shane tells a story about um, the sort of cat coming in on one side of his clinic and the snake coming in on the other side and resuscitation teams working on both of them. So um, I've never had anything like that happen to me. Um, generally speaking, the snakes are brought in decapitated, um, which is. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it is what it is, um, and, and in that situation, it's always the pet who started it. You know, the snake was going about its daily business, getting its groceries, and uh, the dog would catch running and interrupted that. Um, but no, we, we certainly have had them brought in, uh, and uh, yeah, obviously that becomes a health and safety issue for us as well. But it's, it's useful to be, because I kind of know a little bit about this stuff, to be able to identify what it is so we can then treat it appropriately. Um, yeah, so. at least, yeah. It, it is useful. Yeah, it's useful, but it's not necessary. Don't go chasing the snake because you think it'll make a difference with my advice. Thank you, Pam. What happens when a dog comes in with like a, a type of blood clotting disorder? How do you diagnose them? Do you mean with a snake bite yeah. in particular? So that's where we, we take the, the samples that you guys were talking about. So we, we take a blood sample and um, we 
the problem with it, it's got to be an instantaneous result. So you can either buy a machine that runs your plotting times, or we use these little tubes called ACT tubes. So those tubes, what we do is we, we basically rock them by hand for uh, for two minutes, and if they have not plotted within two minutes, that is abnormal. And in snake bites, they'll often be six minutes, and they're still not plotting. Well, the yep, absolutely. So von Willebrand's um, is, is that factor eight deficiency, factor X deficiency, factor eight, is it? Yeah. Um, uh, von Willebrand's disease, hemophilia. There's lots of sort of clotting disorders. As I said, if I do a clotting test on your dog. That's just been bitten by a snake. That doesn't tell me it's definitely the snake that's caused the clotting problem. If it's a Doberman and it's got von Willebrand's disease, uh, then it will. Have you got a Doberman? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if it's if it's got von Willebrand's disease, then yeah, it might not clot because of that. Um, so it's not. It's what we call a, a sensitive test. So it will. In fact, it's not even a particularly sensitive test, but it will pick up when they have a clotting issue. Doesn't tell you that clotting issue has been caused by a snake. Of course, it was a Doberman owner that can't ask that question. <laughs> Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, um, was it possible for the antivenom venom 2 Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the standalone brown snake antivenom is cheaper because it's just got one type of, of uh, antivenom in it. Um, so that's why it's useful to have you know, a, a sort of confirmation. The problem is we can't necessarily take people's word for it. You know, and they say it was definitely a brown snake, like those pictures showed, it's not always that easy. So we could, you know, for the sake of saving, it's maybe like $150, $200 difference on the, the, the specific brown snake versus the, the multi-brown. Um, and we wouldn't take that risk generally, or we wouldn't advise taking that risk. We'll always give people the option. Um, if you're 100% confident, I'm happy to go for it. If Tamika came in and said her dog had been bitten by a brown snake, I'd probably believe her, because um, she knows what a brown snake looks like. Uh, but it's something that we, we wouldn't always trust because heat at the moment, stress, Everything's moving pretty quickly, adrenaline. Do we get target snakes around that area? Today? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and I'll um, hear what you need. So ask questions, no problem at all. So I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I'm going to explain a bit about Reptile Victoria. So we're just a, a new group, so we'll flick through the slides. Um, so basically, um, we set up Reptile Victoria to become an organisation to look after reptiles. So one of the things um, as a, an emergency phone operator for Wildlife Victoria is that reptiles get a bit of a bad rep. And I've always been a snake person. I've been a snake catcher for about uh, 15 years when I could see. It was a bit challenging when I couldn't see. In fact, the last snake I caught as a, um, on a field trip was a blind snake who was blinder than I was. <laughs> but um, generally speaking, I kind of went away from reptiles for a while. I kind of retired in a sort of a way that um, I thought, you know, I don't really have much else to do. But um, with Tamika and Steve McNeil and a bunch of other people that we set up Reptile Victoria with the aim of doing rescues and rehab, uh, education and workshops similar to this one, and um, research, there's always a bit of work to be done, so we do like to try and do a bit of research on the side as well. And uh, obviously we always seek volunteers to be part of our group. And in the last three years, we've really increased the group from about four uh, committee members into a team of nearly 100 people. Okay. So some people just pick up blue tongues, frogs, some you know, take on snakes, people like Stephen um, and Tamika do a bit of a snake catching when we need someone to free a snake in a net. Uh, people won't pay, for example, that kind of where our group can really excel and help out. So we love reptiles. Um, as Dr. Chris has been also one of those vets who really donates his time and sometimes his money when it comes to medicines and things. So part of the idea of this group is to get out, meet the community. We did Horsham a while ago. Um, we've done uh, Bendigo this week in Giftland. We did um, during the bushfires. So we're really trying to get out and, and meet, especially the rural communities who don't get a lot of attention. Um, although a friend of mine just said tonight, hey, Bendigo is actually quite big. And it's like, yeah, it's just a city. It's, a, it's quite amazing how big Bendigo has grown in the last 10 years. All right, so um, we'll go to the next slide. So basically, um, when it comes to living with snakes, it's sort of an attitude about the idea of sharing with snakes. So I'm more about the balance, being you know, respectful of wildlife, uh, how to coexist in a in, you know, confined area, the bush, your home, all of it. Next one. So um, just talking about the thing that we do, which is a, a rescue. We do the professional removals. Um, we also rescue in urban yard, blue tongue, sometimes get attacked by dogs and cats. We treat those. And we also have a special advice line where we try and help you. You can bring up with your reptile problem. And we have quite a few partners, Wildlife Victoria being one of the main ones. And we take care of those situations. Next one. OK, so. Um, when it comes to this area, we're just hearing from the um, Dr. Chris and Stephen about the common animals around here. So I've got the tiger snake at the front, which shouldn't be, it's not necessarily in order. Usually I do it scientific names. But um, there are tigers around the peripheral of this region. Eastern brown snake by um, a long shot is your main problem snake, which we'll get into. Bed bellies are around. There's a little inoffensive one called the whip snake. Um, it's very innocuous and normally the cat brings them in and they're often mistaken for little brown snakes or vice versa. Um, you don't see the blind snake around here all that much. Could I caught the last one? But no, um, <laughs> it is endangered. Uh, or it's vulnerable, I don't think it's endangered yet, but um, it's a very, very pretty one. Um, and you get escaped pythons. We've had a few, uh, surprisingly, that come in. So um, sometimes diamond python, carp pythons in common. All right, next one. Okay, so I guess we already know what a snake is, but it's just good. We never know what kind of crowd we're talking to. Um, it's very important to recognise that a snake can be um, ID'd very quickly, has a forked tongue. If it has legs and has a forked tongue, what do we think it is? A goanna. <laughs> it's the other animal, has a forked tongue. So you might see the heads of the forked tongue. That's not always mean a snake. If it's got four legs and a long tail, it's definitely going to be one of the goannas we call a lace monitor around here. If it uh, has no eyelids, so just they have a, a, an eye that has a spectacle over it, and they um, generally, hence people say, it has a fixed stare. It's like, well, the, eye, the snake's like, I wish it could blink, but I can't. So um, definitely has no eyes. It has venom. An interesting uh, conundrum these days is that lizards have been known to have small venom glands, including the lace monitor. But we still stick with the idea that snakes generally have venom. 
Um, not all snake, but just in relation to around here, definitely true. They have an ability um, to dislocate their jaws, which makes them a little bit gross, but think of it this way, but they have a small head, no knives and forks, no way to cut down the food, so they've learned to just open, uh, dislocate their jaw and walk their jaws over the food and basically bring it into their stomach and then swallow it. So quite um, an amazing ability. Um, and no ear opening. So they're not technically deaf in the true sense of the word. They kind of have a little bone that's inside the inner ear that I guess can pick up vibrations of some sort. But um, it definitely has no ear opening, which is very important when you find a leg lizard and they have an ear opening. Next one. All right, so just to sort of a wildlife fix stats here. Um, wildlife Victoria does a lot of the... Um, calls for wildlife calls all over Victoria. They do get quite a number of snakes and it's very interesting. The guys have tried to label them, but it's generally fairly inaccurate um, because you know you might get a copperhead that looks very similar to a red belly black snake. Um, you do get brown snake with, as um, Stephen said, with bands or little patterns on them. And um, that can also be confused with tiger snakes. So uh, we also get the occasional crocodile, which is really funny. And when it comes in, there's a crocodile and it's floating around the Yarra River um, in a lake and ornamental pond. And it's one of those garden bobblehead with the crocodile head floating around. <laughs> and uh, that's our favourite call pretty much for a reptile. It's, um, I get this emergency, there's a crocodile in the lake and it's not, you just know it's a garden ornament. Um, but yeah, you'll see down the bottom, what there is, is a large amount of unknown, snake unknown. So um, that means no idea, just saw it moving, disappeared, and gives you a bit of a, a quick glance. All right, next one. So when it comes to snakes, one of the most famous things is someone will tell you it's a brown snake, it's a black snake, it's a grey snake, it's a pink snake, or it could be any, any colour snake at all. Um, and what is the first lesson you take away from tonight? All snakes, all snakes in general. A bit more um, when it comes to colour, what does colour mean? Brown snake, brown, black, brown, brown. Right, so would you put your life on saying what type of snake it is just by colour? No, no. Good. That's the most important thing I can teach you. One of them anyway. Colour means nothing. Um, there are pythons that look like mulga snakes. And in Darwin, that's the biggest problem. People pick up python, wrap it around the neck, get in the car, go to the pub, <laughs> and they pass it along the pub, everyone's drinking, and someone gets bitten, and yeah, it's just a water python. Come on, I know my snakes. I've been here for 20 years. They start throwing up and their arm goes numb, they get run to the hospital and it's a mulga snake. They've been passing around one of Australia's most dangerous snakes and a very dangerous snake is hard to treat with antivenom. So colour means nothing. So that's the first idea about that. Um, anybody want to take a, a sort of a guess at what that is? Snake. Really? <laughs> and ideally it could be anything. Could be a tiger snake, could be a brown snake, could be anything. Hence, that's why I like that um, picture. It just shows you that you just don't want to do it. Okay, it's got a thick body, it's big, buffy, it could be a tiger snake. But brown snakes are also big and thick sometimes. So I really like to just show that um, initially. It could be a copperhead, it could be a whole variety of things. All right, next one. How do you identify them if they're so hard to tell when you get from the different breeds, like species of snakes? What's that, sorry? How would you identify them? You mean me personally? Yeah, like so, anyone, if you said we Yeah, so someone, for example, had a photo, which is often the case these days, I'll send it through. You can zoom in on scale. You can, um, for example, let's say we're around Bendigo and someone said, look, uh, a, a big snake has bitten a, um, a dog and it died. They've got the body to say the snake being ripped in half. Sometimes you can turn the body upside down, look at the tail. And if it's got divided scales, you'll know it's an eastern brown snake. And if it's got scales, a, a single, what we call um, free animal scales, it's like a um, single scale, we'll know that's a live bearing snake. It's one of those little tricky things. And the divided scales tells me it's a brown, then I can say, look, it's an eastern brown snake. If it's single, then I'll say it could be a tiger or um, a red belly. Um, but even red bellies have a few divided scales, which sometimes help. So the little tricks of zooming in on the scales themselves, they have certain shapes. You can count the mid bodies, um, which is going from one side across the other if the photo is good enough. Um, and sometimes the head, the type of eye, you can sort of zone in, but we're lucky. In Victoria, most big snakes are going to fit into a very few. You get a Queensland, someone sends you a photo, it's like, oh, 
there's hundreds of snakes up there, so it can be quite complicated. So yeah, very risky. If I've got it in person, I can do the mid-body scales, tail scales, look at the head. Um, I'm not great at all that um, in taxonomy sense, but we know enough to get by um, with the differences between them. Um, what's the other classic thing? Browns have little uh, speckling on their belly, and that gives them away as a... Um, although, Stephen, have you seen them without the speckling ever? Yeah, I've, I've had them turn up with um, yeah, very, very low amount of um, mottling on their stomach. Yep. And other time really, really pronounced. Um, yeah. I've had striped browns. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the key identification with the experts is very much that scale count. Um, so they can use these, every species has a specific scale pattern that they use for them to be identified. Uh, for us, we've only really got to determine between three species up here, and it's very much about their um, body movement and, and their actions. But yeah, it's a lot easier here. It's a lot harder than going. You get cockheads and tigers, and they're a very easy one to use. Mm. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so one of my parts is I'm just going to talk about this, for example, about um, snakes. So we kind of want to come up, you know, I could go do a talk like this type of thing, and someone says to me, oh, snakes chase you. You know, talk. Um, snakes will hunt you down. If you kill their partner, they're going to come in the house <laughs> and they want you. <laughs> and there's no talking to them. They believe it. It's totally fixed. Um, farmers are very much prone to, oh, I kill every snake because, you know, if you don't, they um, will get the cows, milk the cows, they will um, <laughs> do just some strange things. So there's all these sort of myths, and they did have a sort of a, you can track it back a little bit and vary depending what pulse you're talking to, where they come from. Um, Anglo Saxon have very fixed beliefs, so you can have really interesting ones. And it's been a very amazing thing about cultural diversity. We have an amazing enrichment of people now. And their experience is all amazing. And I love talking to people from different parts of the world. And the thing they believe in uh, are amazing. So let's keep going. So one of the things is, uh, just before we get too far into this, and I was just going to touch on something that we're all worried about dying. And part of the snake thing where you fear a snake and a mist creates that fear. Um, one of the great things, I was just doing a little bit of research around um, mortality, trying to get some facts, I thought, oh, look, it's, it's been a bit, you know, the dad had to worry about that. What I found interesting was that in 1907, if you um, look at it, you were likely to live for 35 years. Children between the ages of zero and four, but, so by comparison to 2007, were 95% more likely to die. So we've gone, like in this space of 100 years, accelerated to living to 80, and probably now even close to 90. So people have this sort of growth that we've doubled our lifespan. But the cost of that, obviously, is all the different diseases that go with that. But the fear is still there. Strangely enough, the historic evidence shows they weren't really worried about snake bite in 1907. They were worried about dysentery, diseases, but their hygiene was quite poor. Kids would get very sick between the ages of zero and four. That was foremost thing in their mind, and it wasn't snake bite, it was dysentery, it was a killer. It wasn't cancer, um, it was more the hygiene disease. They didn't have penicillin, which came in World War II. So death was extremely high. And looking at the team in here, you're all like about 15 to 20, you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're not quite yet at the 35 year level yet. Um, but if you're like me, I'm 50-something, and uh, I should have died a long time ago. So it's really good. So I want you to always focus that in your mind, that things have improved, medicine has improved, and you do live in the greatest country in the world. So there's a lot to be thankful for. So we'll keep going. Okay, so when it comes to snake bite, um, it was in the 19th century. It was treated in the most bizarre way. So I looked up some records around Bendigo, I looked up some records around Melbourne, and I did write a book called Living with Snakes uh, a while ago, which I touched on um, this sort of history with snakes. So um, it's very strange. So chloride of lime, it should be, and strychnine were two types of things that were injected. There was uh, this brandy thing where, you know, I think, hey, give us some brandy. And then, you know, they staggered somewhere and given some more brandy. He got to the hospital, more brandy, brandy, brandy. And you would read this sort of detail how it went from a sort of an, like um, Strathville Safe example, and they transferred someone to a hospital. And all the way, every time he got somewhere, 
put him into the horse and cart, that's all I had. Quick, hit him some more brandy, he's coming around. So brandy, brandy, brandy. You just think, wow, I had to be alcohol poisoning, but killed him in the end. <laughs> because it was way so much, uh, they kept giving it to him all the way through. Um, the injections, oh, that's weird. And it's a medical paper that recommended it. It's not like some guy just decided he'd do it. It was actually in the medical journal in the 1850s or 70s. Um, so there's this really bizarre thing. And the tourniquet was a big one. Amputation, so it's quite common for woodcutters to be bitten by something and just chop off that, uh, um, that hand or a finger, whatever was bit, and then just like apply a tourniquet. Um, you just think, well, and you imagine what we know now, that out of 3,000 snake bites, 300 actually, generally speaking, become envenomated. So if you were sort of like part of that 2,700 that had a dry bite, injection, <laughs> drinking, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, yeah, that's probably not wise. Um, so it really highlighted this, the where the myth, the hysteria comes from, this is part of it, because they did a whole strange range of treatments um, dogs had to be seen to be doing something. I couldn't imagine what they were doing to the dogs and, and horses at the time, but um, the tourniquet is a big one where the ligature and it would be rubber tubing or it could be um, string and they just tie it off. And of course, as you all guys would all know, once you stop the circulation over a period of time, that tissue starts to um, turn the product and die. So it's just part of the background, so keep going. So the thing about this added to it was that in the 19th century we had these showmen which were um like the media was starting to print stories you know a young man was bitten by a snake and despite all attempts of brandy and tripping injection unfortunately passed away right um these guys would then come up with their antidote so we call them the antidote tellers an amazing legendary um author and her called john tan did a couple of really great books about these guys so um, I definitely suggest reading them. Um, they're very important references to our past. But the short answer for us is that these guys kind of took the snake to another level. And so over a fairly you know, period of time, they'd catch a snake, they'd have pits of death and snakes all roaming around. Of course, there were shows like, you know, the circus carnival type thing that, that people would come and there'd be all these myths and stories perpetuated. This is where it all starts to grow in its own number, growing and growing. It's not to say uh, bad things about people from the past, which I don't like to do. It's more to say that in that era, that's what developed people's interest. Because in Australia, we don't have many animals that create fear and guardians, do we? Think in America, you've got bison, you've got mountain lions waiting on every ridge, you've got rattlesnakes all around you, cougar over here, there's a bloody grizzly bear behind me. I'm stuffed. I'm in the bush, you know. But here, it's pretty much just the snake. So, um, it's good to have a villain, basically. All right, so the snake men um, did a great sort of, um, sort of, uh, they got all the snakes together, showed you what was around, showed you behaviors, and so they created this kind of um, mythical beast. All right, next one. To give you an example, um, these are two relatively famous people. Like I said, part of me doesn't normally use names when people have just um, passed away. But you can see on the left-hand side, that was a sort of a way of proving that my antidote for example, works. They let snake bite them. So we prove the brown snake, an eastern brown snake, you know, get rev it up and then like that. And so he, you know, he'll be doing a, a performance. And it usually works. So the snake might not be interested in injecting venom, it might have done this over and over for a period of time, and it just performed as requested. On the other hand, a few people did get envenomated and would collapse, and then everybody would rush into the doctor, and he's like, no, no, I'll just take my own antidote and and they passed away. And that's the cost of show business. So very severe cost, obviously. Um, so these are famous type of stories that these guys had done so much work with snakes, they knew them so well, and then they were also theatrical <coughs> entertainment. So nothing like me, I have no theatrical entertainment value whatsoever. But in these days, people were, were in awe of these type of snake people. All right, next one. So when it comes to uh, snakes, bite in particular. Uh, I put this photo in, it's actually a movie, I don't think it works, but um, we did bail up a rattlesnake in America and when I was there I got the insurance, which is really good, a blind man chasing rattlesnakes in Arizona. <laughs> I didn't mention the blind part, just the rattlesnake chasing. 
Um, and they're like, yeah, that's fine, take out the insurance, uh, because you know, the cost of getting treated in the US, does anyone want to have a guess? Yeah. Yeah. How much? Just a thousand, but then I don't know. Okay, so my quote was 250,000. Oh, yeah. All right, now in Australia, we do get treated with a Medicare card, <laughs> which is really good. Um, if you're running a business, you will get charged. I don't know if it's still true now, but you used to get charged with a second vial of antibiotics, which doesn't matter. It's two and a half grand, I'd pay it. Um, but the rattlesnake trip was interesting because I wasn't so much worried about the initial trying to survive the effect. They have a high degree of morbidity, which means damage to your physical well-being. So when you get bitten by things like cobras, um, crates, vipers, and rattlesnakes, their venom is very destructive. It destroys muscle tissue. So when you're having, you know, you're catching up with people in the US or Europe and they've had rattlesnake bites, they sort of show you and part of their legs all being eaten away or they turn their arm over and there's this big gaping hole or they're missing, their fingers are all um, dissolved away. Pretty gross. And that is quite typical with things like rattlesnakes. They've got a, a, their venom works differently. So this is long-term cost. Whereas as Dr. Chris was saying, when the dog get bitten, there's this kind of treat the, anti, treat the venom and the envenomation, and suddenly they recover and they're back to normal so quickly. So it's really different. The bite in the world um, comes quite differently. So next one. So here in Australia, we're talking about um, the snake bites. So some of the myths that we talked about earlier. So we're talking about things like um, snakes drink milk. I love the drink milk because if I had a pet snake, I'd give it um, really good milk, like for rich coffee, or I'd be really nice, give it a treat, right? We did do a little study where um, a venom research lab, we took out water from, I think it's around about 50 snakes of different species. And generally snakes, you put water in, uh, let them drink the water, you can take it out for a few days, let them sort of get a bit thirsty, put the water back in, and they'll drink it, okay? So what we did do was take all the water out, and I think it's about three days, we left it, we put the source of the milk in each one. But I said to them, I'm writing a book, I really do need to know if it's true or not. And I've never seen any papers released about it. And every single snake from all Australian species uh, kind of went up, looked at the milk and go, I don't know what that is. It just went away. So then we took the milk out and the next day put water in and their head all went straight into the water like that. So milk has no interest to them, not even when they're thirsty. So we can sort of scratch that one out. Um, I'm not 100% sure where it comes from. Uh, I'm assuming it's something to do with the US or perhaps a, a European snake. Uh, I like the rolling down the hill, because I can't work out whether they actually grab the tail and roll that way, or would they turn on their side and roll down? Isn't that from Disney, where they roll down the hill? Sorry? Isn't that from Disney, where they roll down the hill? I don't know. What movie is that? Oh, it's the old... Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it might be the hoop snake or something. Yeah. They, just sort of like, they roll by grabbing the tail, rolling down. Yeah. But I can't work out which way they're supposed to roll. That's interesting. They roll down, but they roll up. Roll rolling down. Rolling down, okay. Who wants to roll up a hill? That's <laughs> bit of a treat. Um, so that's a good one. Um, there were snakes like hoop snake where they grab their tail, or there's a hognose snake, I think, that pretends it's dead. There's all these different things that snakes do all around the world. We do have what's called a bandy bandy snake, and he throws himself in his hoops. And so there's a hoop snake theory um, around where he's banded, and he does his weird defense behavior. We're not really sure why, but he does put these hoops up and he throws his um, hoops. So when you see the snake do that, you kind of sit there going, why? What could that do? Like, and even what predator he's trying to throw off is quite fascinating. Um, so there's a few that you can read from there. Uh, we talked about. Um, Snake can be identified as venomous by their colour or their shape or their form, and always the same answer is not, you know, not in your life would you try it. And it's been proven to be wrong so often. Um, snakes bend their mates, we talked about that one earlier, and I think that sometimes comes initially, the two of them are quite close, so snake die after sunset. They, they kind of do die after sunset, they also die in the morning, they die in the middle of the day, <laughs> they can even die at night. <laughs> so they definitely can but it's not only, and not, you know, some specific thing. Uh, so there's a whole range, <laughs> it's a good one, but these are only just a handful. So 
I just wanted to get the idea that there's all these, um, even down towards the end, you'll see there's a shortage of antivenom. Um, snake plague is the other, I love snake plague. Because really it happens, um, it's me doing it. I get <laughs> lots of babies and I pump them full of food, I put them in a plane and I throw them out as I <laughs> go to Sydney and they spread all over Australia. That's my plan. And unfortunately people are catching on. <laughs> snake plagues only come from the idea that a snake goes from being a little baby snake like this to say a big eastern brown snake, they're four foot, five foot long, or 1.8 meters is about as big as they can come up yet. And that takes quite a few years. So let's say this year is a great snake season, a lot of food around, they haven't had to trouble people in houses as much, they gobble up lots of food, they had a great season. It still doesn't make them, you know, they'll grow faster to a point, but they still need a few years to get to a big size where suddenly you get calls, um, dozens and dozens of you know, snake catchers are ringing up saying I'm getting hundreds of snake calls or, and all that kind of stuff. That's more to do with the type of season that you're going through, type of natural events, bushfires, disaster, excessive heat, and they fight snake movement, and that's true. One of the interesting ones we get on snake calls too is you know, we apply for a baby snake and then we quite deliberately try to educate people and explain them that that's a three or four year old snake. Yeah. You know, oh, that's a ripper. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. And you say, what's a baby snake? Oh, a couple of, you know, two and three foot long. Yeah. And you're like, oh, a baby snake kind of like the length of your hand. Yeah. Then it's a pen. Oh, nothing like that. Yeah. And you don't like it when you're crawling down a hole trying to get something that you think is a baby snake because they're telling you it's a baby snake. It's actually a lot bigger when you're trapped in a little confined space and it's like, okay, not a baby. <laughs> the uh, drinking milk too comes from America and South America. There's a, a rat snake that used to go to dairies and the farmers and the teachers were showing up the milk. Yep. The actual fact is going up the roads to the area, so it's a, it's a misidentification of the bar. That helps. But that one always bothered me. Beautiful. This is good. It's very good. Dr. Chris helped me with a whole lot of pet things I needed to know, so um, it's always good when other people are doing talks and helping out. Um, and the last one was that we talked about the snake plague, and the sorry, previous one before that was the shortage of antivenom is important because there cannot often be a comment. Antivenom can be quite controversial. Hospitals have to store it, they've got a, sort of a certain lifespan. What used to happen uh, going back 20, 30 years ago, the old antivenom was given to all the vets, and the vets would then be giving it to people that couldn't afford to um, pay for antivenom, but they kind of cut that off quite a while back. So uh, you have to keep storing and they have to come in pairs. And at the moment, there's a very controversial topic about the fact that you don't need two, you only need to use one. And so the hospital's only been storing one. So a couple of deaths ago was related to this incident of just storing one vial of antivenom and it cost this person, well, a lot of things went wrong for him, but it did cost him his life by only having one vial. And to give you an example, that I'm only here today because I had an awesome doctor, two vials of antivenom, and um, I had the most amazing nurse staff in at a very great hospital, Marinda Hospital. And they did all the things right. They worked with a toxicologist who basically came online, helped them, had a difficult antivenom um, thing they had to go through. And to cut a long story short is that's what saved me. So there's no way around it. So I owe my life to a lot of the people that did all the work in creating antivenom, the people that trained to do it, and the staff, um, and the medical staff and a team that do a lot of that work with um, treating snake bites. So good on you guys. Um, so the shortage of antivenom is not necessarily true, but there are issues in relation to the storage of it. If someone gets bitten the day before you, for example, they might have used up their two vials, but then they've got to quickly get the next set. But especially in Victoria, the antivenom is made in Melbourne, so you'll get it really quickly, um, even if there was multiple bites in one day. All right, let's move on. Okay, so let's uh, do a couple of top 10 things. One of the things I hate the most, and it's probably my personal thing, is this idea that Australia has the top 10 deadly snakes. Ooh, very scary. Um, okay, so a couple of people die, usually because the venom process had been advanced, they didn't know they got bitten, there's a whole bunch of complications. A lot of people get treated quite well, they've got great anti-venom, that's true. But on the scale of the rest of the world, and then we have a talk about the rattlesnake and the long-term effects, um, they're life-changing, some of them. the cobras and rattlesnake bites, it's shocking. In Australia, we had this thing that we, there was a test done probably in the 70s, when it was, well, maybe it was late 60s, 
they did a series of tests on mice using uh, traces of venom from Australia's national centre for fish, you know, per um, 500,000 mice, um, you know, roughly 50% of them would die. And so therefore they rated all the snakes, which became this famous top 10 list, the LD50 test. Um, it's, it's kind of for its time was helpful because they wanted to work out, you know, venom toxicity and it's very important to work it out for anti-venom purposes and promoting the production of anti-venom and other reasons. But coming down to the members of the public, I've never been a fan of saying to someone, the tiger snake is the number four uh, venomous snake in the world, because not. Uh, if it was done on mice, sure. If I'm a mouse reading a newspaper, holy moly, tiger snake around here, number four. <laughs> yeah, that makes a big impact on me as a person. And like Dr. Chris was saying about horses, surprising how susceptible horses are. And yes, that cat just go, yeah, okay, I'll wrap it up and go to sleep, keep my eyes open for a week, and I should be right. <laughs> they kind of get this really weird combination. Animals are all affected differently. And when we get to the snake, which I'll try and get to soon, I'll tell you why. Um, so when it comes to this top 10, just kind of get rid of it, right? Brown snakes, sure, are the most troubling snake that we have. Typhans are the scariest. So when you talk to snake catchers and snake handlers, and you say to them, which snake would you really not want to get bitten by? We'll all say the type of uh, They're like the kickboxer of snake. Just a roundhouse, just hit me in, I'm, I'm gone. And a tiger snake is more like a bit of a boxer, you know? He'll give you some big bruises and he'll bash you up a little bit, gonna hurt. Um, and the copperhead to me is like the, the border monkey. You know, if you leave him alone, he's fine. He's a gentleman. <laughs> but when it comes to all these things about the top 10, they're not relevant. They're not helpful. And it doesn't do anything to promote snakes in general. It's just important to respect them, leave them alone, is a, is a clear message we want. All right, so let's scroll down. We'll leave that one there. It was just good to touch on the top 10 because everyone does that, often talk about um, things. So, and we've done the myths, so I might leave that. Um, I only put those there, they're just basic things about aggression. Uh, they're all the stories and the things we talked about, but at least I tell you the origin where they come from, and that's an example. Okay, so Bendigo snakes, um, so basically snake bite's been quite rare around here, and this, I was talking to Chris, um, sorry, Dr. Cliff, originally a, few, a, a fair while ago about something else, but with Stephen talking tonight, doing a little bit of research in the area, there was a death from a, a young herpetologist, or maybe, well, it was middle age maybe, but um, in Harcourt, I think from a little whip snake. And that's been the only kind of death, and that was a sort of a more of an accident, a reaction to being hypersensitive or medication he was on, we're not sure. But generally in this area, you haven't had a death in like a really long time. And brown snakes are really funny in that Victoria, brown snake deaths are almost non-existent. And again, I'm baffled when you're talking about the pets, for example, clearly they, they can target pets and do some damage. But brown snakes will get too soon, I'll explain a little bit about why that might be so. Um, but the old stories I got were pretty much all about bite, unknown snakes, um, and like I said, how many of them must have been dry bites and all the stuff they did to these poor people is crazy. All right, so we'll go through, keep going. So, um, one other thing I want you to just remember, we talked about some really important things, all right? So, difference with Dr. Chris and domestic animals, okay? You grab the dog and you jump in the car and the police chase you down the street and say, how much fun would I have doing that? Especially and, uh, you know, there's this rushing, crazy, let's get to the hospital and do it like Miami Vice style or one of those um, cop shows. But generally it's the other way. What I want you to do is call triple zero. Apply a bandage. Let triple zero tell you what they want you to do. And the staff are going to do that. And it's amazing about being calm. How do I become? I've just been bitten, I'm going to die any minute. The family's freaking out, the kids are crying, everyone's uh, upset. Snake catchers ring me up when I train, I used to do some snake training. They ring me up, I'm the first person they call. And you're like, what have you done? Oh, I'm, I'm calling you, what do I do? So you did a snake training course, you've done all these things, you tell people, because you do shows yourself, you tell people what to do when they get bitten, what do they do? I don't know. So it's quite amazing that even snake people could sometimes be quite upset to the point they don't know what to do. So a member of the public, you've got to understand being calm is so hard, isn't it? So I do want you to remember be calm. That's really important. Keep everything as calm as possible. Ring triple zero. Apply the compression bandage. This is a five thing just to remember. 
because these are the key things. Triple zero will keep you in the loop and tell you what to do. They won't leave you on your own, just like. The great thing about this whole country is that we'll fly a helicopter and pick you up. Even if you are in the middle of nowhere, like a, a numb nut doing something, God knows what, on your own. And you've got your satellite phone, having trouble. Yeah, okay, well, we'll fly, get you out. It's going to cost you an arm or leg if you don't have um, ambulance cover. I suggest you get ambulance cover if you think about doing those things. Um, this is Australia. When you speak to people in Thailand, um, India, Vietnam, guess what they do when they get bit by snake? Well, some of them go to witch doctors, some of them just sit on the, the rice paddy and they die. That's a fact of life. There's no medical help for them. No one's going to fly a helicopter to them. But guess where you are? In the very best country in the world. So be mindful of that when you've started to panic. Okay, great. We've got our own antivenom, ambulance system, everything is fantastic. So you're in good hands. Okay, next one. Oh, sorry, go back one. It's my fault. Uh, the not to do's. There's always some not to do's. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, but these are kind of, we talked about, don't bring your friends. Don't FaceTime, don't Facebook. Uh, social media is big on snake bite. People are sort of like, oh, just stop it and think about what to do. Yeah. Okay, just start uh, designing a cross and a cop and it'll be helpful. <laughs> so it's important, triple O should be there, not bringing your friends, your wife, the kids, uh, parents, whatever it is. And that's a common mistake that some people do. Um, do not avoid applying a bandage. And the reason I say that is that some people want to know if something's going to happen. Uh, I might wait until I go paralyzed and my eyes will not close. Then I'll know I should have put the bandage on. Um, so really important, put the bandage on, don't avoid it. You can look silly, you can kind of say, I think I've got bitten, um, maybe I'll put it on anyway, just to be sure and go to hospital, it's a bit embarrassing, you hang your head and, you know, get shame if you're a snake person and you're like, something bit me in my collection of snakes, bit me, I'll have to go to hospital. I know it's dry, but I still have to do it. And that's really important. So, um, and do not try to catch, kill a bag of snake. Hospitals don't like it. <laughs> they really don't. Um, we do get called out. I mean, I don't personally anymore, but you used to 20 years ago. There's a snake loose in one of the medical labs because why? Someone brought a box in and didn't tape it up properly and the snake's out. Got a bit of a shovel wound on halfway down its body and it's rearing up and it's looking around, everyone's on the table. Um, they don't like it. I can tell you that. The hospital do not like you bringing this snake in. You don't need to. Does anyone know why you don't need to? The one anti-venom. Anti-venom, so we, what do we know about anti-venom? So yeah, we've got polyvalent, so we know we can treat it. If we don't know what it is, we can just um, use the polyvalent. We have tests that actually detect the venom. Sometimes there's a little, they can take a swab of clothing from the bite wound, they can drop it in at what they call the snake venom detection kit. It it's, can work well if you train well in it. Um, we talked about the clotting factors. There's a lot of ways to tell what snake bit you. In Victoria, with two and really tiger and brown are the two most severe issues you have to deal with. Um, predominantly, it's quite easy to navigate those waters of ID. If you're in Queensland, there's a massive difference between some of them. So they do kind of want to know, but the testing they do, you can actually tell them. And then they work with specialists in um, venoms that actually help them get through and work out the procedure. Do you think you get anti-venom uh, without showing signs of being sick? Yes. Does everybody think yes? Yes. No right or wrong answer. I was absolutely wrong the first time I heard it. So if, a, if, a, if you come in and you've been bitten by a snake um, and you like me, you're sitting there, will they give you anti better? No, no, no. No, okay. You've got to show something. So you've got to uh, suddenly lose facial muscles, start throwing up, head spinning around in circles, something significant that they just go, okay, uh, I'll take that as snake ventilation. Would you get sick from the antivenom? It's more, it could be, it's more that it'll be unnecessary and it potentially would be more harmful. So there's no point treating you with a really um, big dose. So let's say you got, um, you think you've been bitten by a Tasmanian tiger snake, the amount of antivenom is quite high. 
or at high pH, you meant you know, really large amount of uh, antivenom. So there can be side effects to it, yes, okay. and it's unnecessary and expensive, of course. Mm -hmm. So they really want you to show signs of serious envenomation. So not um, sometimes you can show swelling or you could have your heart racing a little bit. They're not going to give you the antibiotic. Okay, it's going to be life threatening or really serious, but they need to react. Something going on in the blood. Um, that's when they start doing it. So I'm not a medical expert, but I'm just saying it's important to know that antibiotic is given to save your life. So and that's really important. All right, next one. So I know I'm thinking through. Anybody got any questions so far? Can I do this? I think ride and ride like a horse. So I can keep going. Uh, so now we're going to get into the snakes. I do start off with tiger snakes first, mainly because they are the um, prime ones that do affect people and have historically been the most cause of death in Victoria. So they still are. Um, whereas around Australia, it's all about the brown snakes, pipans, and occasionally death adders and moggers. Um, for Victoria, it's always about tigers. So even in the last 20 years, um, aside from the little witch snake incidents, um, most of, nearly all of them are related to tiger snake. And there's a reason for it. They're close proximity to um, urban areas, whether it's by the river systems, the creeks, the lakes, the swamps. Steve mentioned a great point. When you're speaking to someone on the phone, one of the first things we do say is, what's it like around your house? Well, I'm sort of on the Murray River and I'm surrounded by Billabong and I've got these amazing ponds with frogs and tadpoles. And you're like, yeah, tiger snakes. Um, and then someone says, oh, I'm on top of a hill, live near Malden, full of rocks, um, got lots of long grass, lots of skinks. You're like, yeah, these are brown snakes. For sure. And so even just habitats can tell you what something's going to be. So there are overlaps, so snakes aren't territorial, but they cruise around looking for food. Sometimes they'll go up over the hill. A tiger will leave the lake, go up the hill, around the house, and come back down. Um, browns will do the same. They'll go along the rivers and creeks, go for a swim, pop back up. Um, so they're all, uh, they can overlap, but traditionally they have this sort of preference, which is what it is. Tigers are very swampy, um, and their prime initial food, which is very significant, they need baby frogs. That's one of the big things with um, Victorian tigers anyway, is you've all seen frogs when they mate, they have a spawn, the tadpoles, um, and those tadpoles emerge as little froglets. Usually, uh, especially in summer, late summer, um, you get a lot of banjo frogs and spotted marsh frogs and some other uh, common froglets. Little baby tigers, I give the, the young are born um, free at that time, and that's their first preference of food. So if they can get hold of some frogs, they quickly eat a whole bunch. So this season would have been amazing for baby tigers because there was a lot of moisture, a lot of um, breeding going on with the frogs, which matches the um, young coming out of snakes. So these guys here, um, as Dr. Chris was saying, they're neurotoxic, quite powerful. And in the case of snake bite, um, they do present quite dramatically. Mind you, you sometimes don't show signs for 24 hours, so they always keep you in hospital overnight for that reason good 24 hours a day. Um, their bites are usually uh, sort of like at the end of a bit of a hissy show, but they fan out like a cobra, they turn the head on an angle, they can actually, like you'll see them almost getting their venom gland, they can't, don't squirt but so much, almost send a signal and it's just becomes enlarged. So you see this pronounced little lumps on the side and they put venom to their bang. And that takes a tell. So when people are trying to catch them, <coughs> The reason if you accidentally step on a tiger snake and kept walking in a bite, it's often a dry bite because there was no preparation, there was no um, confrontation. If you Jack Russell bailed it up and is shaking it, throwing it all around the yard, the tiger snake's getting ready to bite and it won't be dry. It'll be a full-blown envenomation. And that's why dog attacks and um, snakes inevitably are quite pronounced uh, envenomated. So a dog running through long grass sometimes just gets a dry bite and that can be a life-saving difference. I do break, um, break dogs into two groups, what I call biters and barkers. It's common for a barker to bail up a tiger snake and they both have a standoff. Tiger can't turn, he knows he's vulnerable, so he rears up, keeps his head up high, hissing away, and the dog's barking, 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 and the owners come down and they'll actually call the dog away. 
Um, I did mention, uh, I did sorry here, Dr. Chris, talk about ways to get your dog away, um, a garden hose. Do you want to get a dog's attention? Squirt him from head to tail. Oh, what is this dog anyway? And you squirt him with water and like, whoa, what's going on? It's a good way to break the confrontation. And once it's gone, the snake will take a chance and shoot off while the dog is distracted. And that can work really well. Uh, so tigers uh, are very, you see this uh, very predominantly banded. They usually got a buffy head. This one's a little bit young. So we'll go to the next slide. And you can see that with tigers, they're predominantly, um, traditionally around Melbourne anyway, they, they have this strong banded thing. There is a region I stuck this in here, by the way. Does anyone know why there's a blue tongue here? Yeah, around about 25, 30% of snake calls is this guy. Yeah. And um, well, it's, looks like snake, don't you, Simon? <laughs> it's, it is. It is a poor man tiger snake. I mean, look at it. It's charming. And that, that's another myth that I've heard quite a lot is that if you've got a blue tongue in your garden, you won't have snakes. Yeah, that's a, yeah that's it's a big one. one. And it's funny, this particular a brown snake will actually eat blue tongues. Yeah. But tiger snakes and blue tongues have an understanding. I don't know what the understanding is, but it's actually quite common to find if you lift a sheet of tin up, there'll be a tiger snake here and a blue tongue there that I actually share uh, home sites. The reason I, I do half encourage the idea of when I'm trying to say to someone with a blue tongue is leave it there because if the blue tongue using that hole, tiger snake can't come and use it. And that helps people go, but I don't like the blue tongue, he looks evil, but I don't like, you know, you say, well, tiger snake, got better but let's just keep them out of the yard and so they're like yeah okay I, i'll accept the blue tongue and it's really important because um in wildlife victoria we get a lot of people that ring up and i saw a snake and it, it took off and uh it was running across the backyard and we hit it running like, <laughs> running <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> and it'll be this guy so there's a connection where the initial movement of a blue tongue they tuck their legs in the side a bit the grass is long and because you see one second, maybe two seconds of something moving, it has stripes on it. And look, sometimes they get a shovel to the head and that's really sad when people bring up and say, look, it's got, you know, we've hit it and um, it's because we thought it was a snake. Sometimes it's in like a bushes and um, agapanthus is classic for them. Um, so you can't always tell over the phone whether it is a blue tongue. And a lot of the classic ones that you get is when the blue tongue's gone into a hole, it'll keep you to get his head out. Oh, no. Still there? No. Yeah, still there. Right. Tiger snakes don't do that. But they kind of either stay back in the dark and look through and don't come out. But blue tongue kind of do this picky blue thing. <laughs> still there, all right, let's go back. And uh, so I call it the picky blue effect, which is always a blue tongue. I'm sure a snake can do it occasionally, but it's traditionally a bluey thing. To make people feel better, I say um, top up some uh, banana or dog food, something, and put it about you know, a couple of meters away from the hole, and just stay there and watch it. And the, the blue tongue can't help it; they just come out. Wow! They feed you here. This is the best place ever. And so they'll come out and I'll eat it. And then the people are like, "Yeah, it's got legs. It's definitely a blue tongue." It's like, okay, good. So that's the reason I put it here. Is that uh, snakes aren't always snakes. Around 25, 30% will be the blue tongue, and that's a Melbourne statistic, not necessarily out here. Um, and they are harmless, to the people, if you're wondering. And they, um, the only way you're gonna get bitten by a blue tongue, seriously, is to go up to it, perhaps pay it $30 or something and stick your finger in its mouth, <laughs> and it's possible it could do it. Um, they're generally pretty inoffensive. Um, they really are quite, um, elegant and unfortunately they're very susceptible to dog attacks so they do get injured a lot uh, all over the country so um yeah can so that's just to tell you a bit about Louis. sorry can yeah. i ask a question about the, the dog bite mm. um and, and i'll sort of direct it to chris do they respond to veterinary treatment if they've been bitten if you come tomorrow then i will tell you all about this um but mm -hmm. uh, the, the actual answer is not particularly well. Um, so reptiles uh, in general have one combined body cavity. So we have a thorax and an abdomen. They have what's called a coelom, which is one yeah. big cavity. And if they get any kind of penetrating wound into any part of their coelom, then infection generally can spread right throughout the coelom. They also don't have particularly brilliant immune systems in terms of dealing with local disease. So 
cat bites in particular, the prognosis is, is almost hopeless for, for reptiles with cat bites, even with fairly innocuous looking. If you get a little baby blue in with one cat fang in it, yeah. I can almost guarantee no matter what you do, high level antibiotics, IV fluids, all that kind of stuff, we, we really struggle to get those guys back. And in fact, nowadays, I'll often euthanize them as soon as we see those kind of injuries. Uh, with open body cavities, again, even with major intervention, you're in a lot of trouble. A lot of these guys will come in with guts and, and uh, we, we, there was a story in the paper and we actually had one where a female came in with um, babies, um, so they're live bearing and she had four or five babies inside her, so I um, we anaesthetised her, basically did a, a, a cesarean, that's probably a little bit grand, we literally scooped them out once she was asleep and uh, I um, sort of rehabilitated those and then released them. Um, or they escaped in my garden actually, is a real story. But um, yeah, a lot of the time when they come in with open body cavities, it's, it's not good news. So, what should we do if our dogs are quite hungry? Yeah, Generally speaking, uh, uh, again, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm written a little lecture about tomorrow, but uh, present them to a vet as soon as possible. We do, no vet will ever refuse to see wildlife. Um, obviously, vets have different areas of expertise, but um, if you catch them in the evening, then uh, bring them in a, a, a box with a clean towel. Uh, in terms of bandaging and cleaning things with, with betadine, you can do that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, keep them quiet, keep them calm, keep them somewhere relatively warm. And they are sort of ectothermic, we need some sort of background heat. Uh, but there's not a massive amount you can do, they really need antibiotics and fluids. Uh, and uh, there's not, not a huge amount you can do at home. Thank you guys for coming out for the res res rescue workshop. You will definitely get your um, blue tongues and a large dose. Um, definitely going to be a good day tomorrow. So if you have it booked in, just um, speak to Oscar or to Mika before you head off, and um, just if you want to come in. All right. So we're going to the next slide. Um, so the tiger snakes here. This is an actual um, Bendigo. Uh, sorry, not Bendigo, but Sutton Grange. Go to check in with Chris. Um, we, this is actually a pet one we had from a baby and we reared it up and it passed away last year, 18 years old. So um, again, that's a, a very nice little band of form. Tigers are very predictable in the sense that they telegraph, they communicate in sign language by hitting um, audio language, audio, if you want audio. In visual, I'm going to bang my head out, be all puppy and raise my head up the ground saying keep away leave me alone all the signs they can do um so they're very good in that way that as you come across tiger snakes they rear up suddenly and sometimes they do a little backward hiss strike down and if you just stay still which is hard i know um they actually just slowly go away and go okay you're not going to do anything you're one of those wise guys and then they take off so there's no it's sort of like an initial confrontation, you know, you do it over a log or you're scared or something like that. So they're very good in that they give you a bit of room. One of the key factors about tiger um, confrontation is they've got shocking vision, something we share in common. So unlike me, you can probably approach within about a centre of me and I wouldn't know you're there. But these guys, it's about a metre and a half. So as you're walking through, they kind of think that you're moving but they can't quite see you very well. But eventually when you get within a, a metre and a metre and a half, they start going, oh God, there's a person there or a dog or whatever it is, and they react. When we get to the brown snake, I'll show you the difference. So when you're catching tigers, you just you know, pretty much walk slowly and, and they kind of go, hey, I think someone's there. And suddenly I've got them by the tail and I'm like, damn, I should have trusted my instinct. <laughs> and so they're a lot easier to catch. Um, and then once you've got them cornered, such as when dogs get them, they tend to hold their stance and not move away and stay there. And it's quite common to hear of a snake being up in the backyard with a dog bailing up for hours on end and everyone complaining about the dog barking. So um, it is easily treated with antivenom. Its main problem is that when bites occur in areas that are fairly remote and people panic and try and you know, walk out or do high risk things that accelerates the uh, been absorption and it complicates uh, things a little bit as you get into hospital. So um, it is neurotoxic, it does have disturbances, it also breaks down a lot of your muscles. So we talked about my bite earlier. When I came out, um, I was weak. I, I know the expression is a newborn baby, but I really didn't feel that way. So my arms were all bright blue um, because the muscle had been broken down and I had to stay in hospital for a week. 
because all the proteins in that muscle break down, which is what the myotoxin in the venom does, uh, goes into the bloodstream. And you guys all know about renal failure when you plug the kidney, the protein overload it, and that causes secondary um, uh, death for this snake is that um, renal failure. Sometimes you hear that. And so they, they can be easily trans. Um, you can kind of survive the initial anti venom, but then have complications later. So you can also get um, issues with blood clotting that we talked about when you you know put the venom inside the blood and you shake it and it just goes all thick. So imagine if it's around your head, um, you can have intracranial issues as well. All right, so enough scary stuff. So the tigers do tell you what they're all about. A lot of bites do happen um, in instances of gardening around the house, uh, out in the bush. But generally, a lot of bites go dry. They tend to bite once and it's always dry. Second bite is usually the one that has the venom in it. So when there's a confrontation or if you've accidentally grabbed it or something bad, that's how they tend to roll. Next one. Um, I only put this guy in here just to show you a bit about the colour. The copperheads, Stephen might have correct me, but where's the nearest population of copperhead? Are we talking Macedon or? Uh, kind, they're quite common in kind. Yep, uh, good, right. and you've you got a chance up to sort of around about Harcourt, maybe. Oh, Harcourt, all right. Very, very rare. Very, very rare. Yeah. So it's probably sort of like that northern yeah. distribution. Okay. Yeah. So these are more, they sort of overlap with tigers only in the sense that they like swampy areas, um, dense tussock grass. So where the brown likes dense tussock grass, he likes it a lot drier. And these guys like it where it's moist, a lot of frogs and skinks. So his venom is all about eating frogs and skinks to the point that they sometimes are little pac they just kind of eat things, like they might eat five or six frogs, you'll catch it, hold, like, hold it up, all these little frogs will hop out of them, like come out of the mouth and just hop away. And they're like, thank you, God. <laughs> um, because, yeah, the, the, the copperhead just kind of eats them and just falls them alive, he's not even using his venom. He has a very kind of limited gait, so his mouth doesn't quite open the way the tiger does, he's got a much bigger, um, broader head, the, the jaws dissipate a lot easier. The copperhead's a very polite gentleman snake, so he tends to hold his mouth shut. And he strikes, he keeps his mouth quiet, very polite. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore a lot of people get what's called a headbutt bite. They, just get this, they feel this kind of little tap uh, on the shoe or whatever it is, and it's this guy. Um, and so it's sad in a way because the dogs or cats get hold of them and maul them and they still won't bite. And so ironically, these guys just don't um, get presented in vet clinics or in human cases of snake bite because they really just don't bite very well and they really do tend to bite with their mouth shut. No idea why. Um, they're just a really, really, I call them a Labrador <laughs> snake. So when someone kills one, I just think, hey, you just shot a Labrador. Because mm -hmm. um, they really are sweet, even though the fear is always there, I understand all that. So copperheads, their head is just a different shade of uh, a colour than the rest of the body. They often do have a, a, a ventral surface that's coloured, sometimes pinky red, orange, yellow, and therefore a lot of people call it as a red belly black snake. Or when it's really kind of brownish like this one, this would be called in as an eastern brown snake. And of course we know that colour means... I like this group already. All right, let's roll. Next one. The head, just to show you the eye. Um, there are interesting things about uh, elephant eyes is that we have elephant to quite nocturnal, they have little slits. And then the copperhead has this eye that can be quite a, a big pupil. He actually can come out at night and move around. Tigers have a similar structure as well. They can sort of, just on uh, on a hot evening, they'll come out and forage around when it's still twilight-ish. Um, as you can see there, it's just got a small head and um, like the brown snake, it's quite a small head. Next one. So I just wanted to show you the copperhead briefly, just to show how it's all brown and therefore it's quite confusing. Um, okay, so with the eastern brown snake, not only got this funny eye, um, brown are very unusual, and Stephen probably might swear to this, but they tend to see you from well off. So when you're trying to catch them, they have this spotting thing where you're trying to sneak up and they're like, yeah, right, and they just take off. <laughs> when you go through areas that's covered like brown snakes are very common, um, a, an author um, did a study, a paper on this sort of ability of brown snakes to spot you from a long way away and actually remain hidden. So they had radio track, all these browns, they knew where they were, but they were trying to sort of basically catch them out in the open and it was really, really hard. They kept seeing people and moving away and hiding. 
that's a little bit different than copperhead and tigers that tend to coil up in the sun and actually stay out a little bit too long so as you're walking through you can spot them a lot easier browns have this great eyesight and that eyesight is very specific because its favorite food is a skink so it loves a little skinks and big skinks and blue tongue skinks um, so it will chase them down and therefore you'll see them they'll be moving around i'll see a little skink and i'll straight away go after them so a big brown snake, even though it might be um, 1.5 meters long, will still take a little skink. Whereas tiger snakes tend to go, I want to put the biggest food you've got here. So I want that hamburger with the lot, I'm going to eat it all today. The brown, like, I'll take that, take that, and I'll take this, and maybe half a dozen of those. So um, there's a difference in the way they forage. Um, very small thing, as Dr. Chris was saying. Um, but a brilliant eyesight, which means a lot of the confrontations in Bendigo just don't happen. Browns are out of the way. If you're walking um, with your dog, same thing. The snake can see that contrasting uh, colour of a dog against the um, background of the bush, and he's moving. The big trouble with some hunting dogs is they're very quiet. When they're in stalk mode, they're just moving nice and quiet, and that can be the difference. All right, next one. So when you're looking at brown snakes, um, this is just to give you a bit of a, a, a picture of the fact that they lay eggs. You can see um, a brown snake female there is in a, um, a husbandry setting and it's just laid some eggs inside the box, which is awesome when you're a reptile keeper and you pull something out and it's like, oh, it's laid eggs. Um, strangely enough, they're very calm. So you can kind of separate the eggs and the snake a little easier than they would normally let you. So when they um, are born, I just wanted to show you the hatchlings down the bottom, you can see there's a little juvenile brown snake. Again, that's what they're like when they're um, just hatched out of the egg, which is usually between anywhere from January through to March. Do you ever get them later than March or April? Oh, no. It's mainly that, that summer, yeah. either all the time, yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So they lay them quite early. They laid them really early this year, so they hatch quite quickly. Um, and it's really common around swimming pools, the concrete walls. They love swimming pool walls. And concrete driveways, they'll lay them in the uh, runoff. And so when people say, oh, yeah, there was a big brown snake there. You know, what was it? October, November? It's like, yeah, it's like the egg laying time. Um, and then all these little brown snakes are coming out. So that will look like the cat bring them in a lot. Um, these guys are still very small. Their fangs are so tiny. It's quite hard for them to the, sort of affect animals and people. Not saying it's impossible, just harder. Um, and so, yeah, that just gives you a bit of an idea that starting from the top, you know, obviously um, one of the classic people thing is that they have a maternity, so parents look after the young, they don't. So if that top one is the male, uh, the female will lay the egg, and the male come across that little one, it will be, well, hello, it looks like you're my breakfast. Yes. It won't be, this is your dad talking, it'll be like, no, this is your dad eating. So there's not much with um, eternity with most snakes. There's some snakes that are a bit different. Um, all right, to the next one. Sorry, can I ask a John. question? Um, I've heard different stories about the venom capacity of baby snakes yeah. varying from they're tiny so they don't have any yeah. to they're tiny and they haven't used anything yet so they've got lots stored up. Are either of those stories or anything in between? Stories? It's more that they're going to have venom. So their venom, when we talked about the baby frogs coming out, um, so tiger snake comes across a baby frog, he's going to want to eat it. So his venom is oriented towards his prey at the side relevant. So when brown snakes are small, they're targeting small skinks. Um, and their venom will be kind of oriented. Brown snake venom is kind of a little bit funny that the fangs are so short. They tend to also use a python technique of wrapping around their prey and like biting as much as they can to envenomate it and then if the prey you know um dies soon enough they just start eating it but if, if you're the prey so if they you mean a person if it's a person mm. is the fact that it's a, a 12 mm. inch snake or a 36 inch snake going to change how much venom you get in right so an easy way to explain this i guess is to say that if i was to get a baby tiger snake and I can't remember how much a baby tiger snake has, but let's just say, for argument's sake, it's one milligram, okay? So it's that much. Then you get one that's, say, um, 12 months old, it might be five milligrams. Then you get to a bigger one, it gets more and more. 
So a tiger snake that I call the prince um, had 450 milligrams. So he was a monster, massive triangular head, and it was um, just a tremendous amount of venom to come out of one snake. Chapel Island tiger snake is similar, huge, massive venom gland. Again, their young ones are quite small, don't have um, as much as the adults. So as they get bigger, they have more uh, venom. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, so um, that's the important factor. So when someone says it's a baby snake, if venom is weaker or lower, it's kind of not quite right. It's the same, but if the quantity is much smaller and their apparatus to actually get through the skin, it's very good news. So they can get lucky. They could find it right inside your fingernail, into your underneath your fingernail, for example. You might have already had a cut on your um, finger, and a baby snake just happened to get his banged inside, right into the you know the um, area where the blood is. So you can be very unlucky, but that's what it takes a little bit of being unlucky. The other factor too is so release of brown that you only need two one thousandth of a milliliter to be potentially fatal for a human. So whether it's producing half a mil, one mil, two mil, it really doesn't matter because it only needs such a tiny little bit of actually in there to be potentially fatal. So, yeah. And weirdly enough, that the venom can vary. So Melbourne browns would be really, really different than when you go up to northern uh, Queensland and their brown snake are so incredibly potent. You've got massive more venom glands, their veins are bigger, and um, their venom just seems to have different properties. So tigers from Adelaide are different than tigers in Melbourne. Melbourne targets are different than the ones in Queensland. Yeah. So when they're treating snake bites, the symptoms are actually coming out quite different. So when you're swapping a drawing, and we don't do it a lot, but they say a few snake people get together and they talk about their snake bite. Mm -hmm. Really interesting that the Adelaide guys go through something different. And the Tasmanian guys get a lot more necrosis and necrotic damage around their tissue. They've lost um, you know, their digits and fingers, finger, um, sense of feeling and all those sort of things. So very just in the venom properties as well. So venom is, there's a lot of guys working on it, but still you know, a bit of a mystery, not always so uh, black and white. All right, uh, so with the brown snakes, what we just want to talk about is that these guys are mobile and fast. So when Stephen was talking about how someone says, I saw a snake and it flared up and struck down at my foot or stood up in their shape, it was really fast, shot across the yard, you can kind of isolate what snake is going to be. And there are reasons for that. Brown snakes are travellers, they move to a massive home range, they're quite um, nomadic, they cruise around and they travel. They love mice, that's why they come to the house. If you've got mice in the kitchen, mice in the shed, in the barn, these guys do it. Tigers do like mice, they love baby birds as well. So they'll climb bushes. Um, these guys, I have seen them with baby birds in them, it's not super common, but um, uh, they will take baby birds, they're a bit on the naughty side that way. They will go some into aviaries and take both the mice or the, the baby birds inside the um, bird box or the nest. Um, browns will eat other snakes. Tigers generally don't. Tigers tend to just eat, they're sort of a bit Catholic in that they eat frogs, they eat mice, they'll take rats when they're big enough, and they do love baby birds. So there's a, a predictable nature about what they're doing. These guys um, kind of are fairly Got a broad range of things they'll take, um, even to the point that they'll do snakes, gigs, frogs, um, baby birds occasionally, and um, even small rats. But generally, I've never seen them. Uh, blue tongue, we mentioned earlier, is one of their favourite food, especially uh, shingleback when they're born, and blue tongue newborns. Um, these guys gobble them up. It's their main enemy is kookaburras and snakes. But the poor blue tongue's got a bit of a nasty world to get through in the first few years. So that's the reason they have eyesight to take on faster moving thing. A lot of one of the classic things about brown when you're on a snake job and you can't find it, but you know it's somewhere around, you just wait a little bit and all these mice will start popping up out of holes because the brown snake's actually gone down, he's chasing them, they're all flying out of a hole and you think, yeah, he's around here somewhere. And sure enough, he'll just pop up and look around and he goes after the mice. What he does do in the burrow is he keeps biting them all, bang, bang, bang. So you see all these mice come up and then they'll all just um, pass away. And when he comes up, he'll just take his time and gobble one up, and get the next one, gobble that one. And then he's going to be patient, stand there for a while, when he's finished, just go put him in the snake bag. So um, browns are really good in one hand. They are very um, mobile, got great vision, and they generally keep out of your way. 
What's the downside? They're more bionic upgrade because when you're trying to catch them. You catch a spine they that real quick. When you try and tangle with them, they're a bit of a handful. So they will stand their ground sometimes, they will defend, so they'll turn and basically rear up, open their mouth, and they kind of open their mouth with their fangs are quite small, the belief is that they kind of throw their head at you. Reminds me of a cartoon I saw one, but um, that's their defensive technique. Technique. Uh, one of the downsides, they bite more than once. Tiger's very forgiving, he bites and lets go, he usually tries to take off if he can. They can bite twice, not super common to get bitten three times. These guys are multiple biters. Once they got to that point and they're rearing up and the dog at them, they go bang, bang, bang. They work, they'll try and make you turn away. And so when people turn around, one of the frequent bites is always the back of the leg and the butt. Big brown, he won't get up that high. But and that's because they will keep um, striking. They're trying to make you run for it, even though they're hitting you with the fangs and hopefully, in your case, not getting venom, but in the brown snakes, he's trying to make you leave. So it's a very aggressive stance. And that's the famous one where people say snakes chase you. Because you know they've gone up to a snake and trying to poke it or get the broom or do something or kill it. Suddenly it rears up and they realize in a small space, it's much faster than I am, and rearing up and charging, and suddenly they're panicking and they want to distance themselves and they can't. And that's why the legend of snake chasing you um, is all about this guy. He will, to a point. So when we say snakes don't chase you, we are kind of right. In a limited circumstance, this guy will be very um, upset if you try and have one. I've got a couple of videos on my YouTube channel, uh, Bible C, and I deliberately get the brown snake to sort of mark up. <laughs> and then just by standing still, that snake will then just relax and go. Mm. So I really do bust that myth of them chasing. So yeah, if you want to look. Hey? Uh, I, just, I just love seeing them rear up on me. <laughs> That's great. All right, so it's great for him, but not for you guys. No. <laughs> All right, next one. So tip of the brown snake, that's the important snake in this area. So the venom is very toxic, all right? But an interesting side effect is that around Australia, brown snake had killed quite a few people. When I say a few by um, average, it's still quite low. But they make up a fairly bulk proportion versus going back 50 years ago, where it's mostly tigers that were um, um, causing deaths, mortality of people. Now it's predominantly these guys, and so there's an interesting concept behind what's going on, why there's this sudden change, but the brown snakes have adapted to agricultural areas and disturbed so well, they also eat out other snakes. So we think they're just such a, a great adaptive snake that they've really taken over large tracts of area where you may not have seen them 15 years ago, they've now become the dominant snake. So um, in Victoria though, we still, have extremely few deaths from brown snakes. So in a weird way, it's actually good to have a brown snake versus having a tiger snake. So the question is, do you feel lucky? <laughs> All right, but um, it is fascinating because they are very much not involved in snake bite as much as say tigers are. But it's interesting what Dr. Fish was saying in the, um, the practice, he's still getting the domestic animals coming in when those bite, and that's quite a significant tell. All right, sorry, that there is just a headshot of one caught up in netting. Um, and that is a common thing that Brown do get tangled up in nets, which I believe they're going to be putting a ban on this year, not next year. But there's a, a big push to get the um, netting ban for all wildlife. All right, next one. Yeah, so um, when it comes to manners between snakes, uh, it's not always there. So this is two uh, Highland Copperheads, you don't get them around here. It was just a friend of mine sent me the photo and um, basically snakes will eat other snakes, which is interesting, but they often will eat other snakes to the point that they can't physically get them all in and that can cause the death of both snakes. Some theories are that when snakes have what we call ritual combat, where two snakes, two male snakes are following a female, they're similar size and they come across each other. And there's this ritual kind of, you guys might have seen snakes all twine, like entwined like rope. A lot of people think it's mating, but it's actually two guys slugging it out and uh, they'll try and push the head down of the other one, they'll sometimes bite. Sometimes it gets so advanced that they actually start eating the other snake or the loser, I guess. And, um, but that can also kill um, the snake that's doing the eating because it's too big a meal and you can't get it all in. So I think this guy regurgitated the smaller snake and therefore lived. Next one. 
Um, the other snake around here is just a red belly black snake, and these are like copperheads. They're kind of gorgeous in the way um, that they're very good at um, not being as toxic as a, uh, an eastern brown snake and a tiger snake. <coughs> red bellies do have some really kind of side effects. Um, they are a bit more painful, so when they bite, they tend to create a localised pain. They do have long-term effects in some people, such as uh, losing a sense of smell and hence have really affected people's quality of life. So we still got to treat them with respect. They have less neurotoxic um, potential, like um, browns and tiger snakes. Um, but they put on a bloody good show. So they hiss, they rear up, and they make this loud, explosive noise, and they kind of thrash around a little bit, and it sounds like they're just at the end of the world coming because they're really um, quite a performance uh, show snake. And if you just kind of ignore that, they just kind of go, all right, well, get the hell out of here there. No one believes me, and they just take off. But they do have a really theatrical thing. They do bite um, when obviously provoked like most snakes, handling, catching, trying to you know hurt them. They're very distinctive. Their black is always glossy, really, really glossy black. And the underside is that got that reddish tinge. Um, copperheads, even if they're dark brown and they always look black, they're sort of like a matte black, there's no gloss. And that's an easy way to tell them apart when you see them in the field. But again, colour means... Good. All right. Red bellies are frog ears. They also eat snakes. Um, they're quite big. Uh, we have the biggest one in Gippsland. They get up to a couple of metres. But they're a beautiful snake, really gorgeous, and they're good to have around, so they're not a threat as much to, say, your domestic animals and livestock, and they eat other snakes, so, you yeah, know, be nice to them. They might do you a favour and gobble off a brown snake, or even better, a tiger snake. Um, that's just sort of a ratty-looking one to show you that, you know, when they're coming up to a shed of skin, it's not, and especially with the sun on it, it shows how the eye picks up certain illusion of different colours in that body. All right, the next one. I'm going to wrap it up soon because I know we've been going, it's been a long night for you. Um, just around here, there are little whip snakes. Remember how we talked about the baby brown snake um, earlier? I showed you one little blackhead. This is a similar thing here, and we call um, these guys little whip snakes. And they're an odd one because they are kind of quite um, Potent, they cause a bit of local like pain. So when, when people get bitten, they always say, well, it stings a bit, you know. Um, so there's definitely something going on, and I've heard people with stomach cramps and a few other side effects from them, really, really not feeling well um, all day long. So they are quite potent for their size. Going back to the old snake books, they used to always list all these things, and this was one of them that say harmless. And nowadays, we don't do that. We kind of say, you know, it's potentially, it's potentially harmful. Um, and that's true. They do have some effects, and the more you get bitten, the more the pain increases, so there seems to be susceptibility. Um, snake people can be allergic to snake venom because they've been bitten so often, um, and they get really strong reactions to the point they can collapse. And so that's the problem with a snake like this. Um, it can cause a collapse in a person who is already sensitive to snake venom. So for you guys, it's no big issue other than if it gets brought inside, it looks very similar to these and grass snakes. Um, juvenile. And over the phone, one of those examples, we can sometimes ID them and help you out. But usually uh, they're nocturnal and they, they pretty much live under rocks. Um, so Malden has quite a few there. Not sure where, where else Harcourt's full of them. Um, Stephen probably knows this area a lot better for, for me. Yeah, they've come across one. So really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. How big is a little whip snake? Uh, about 25 centimetres, so a little bit small, maybe 20. Um, they're not very big, sort of <coughs> really big female like that, and then the smaller males are usually a little bit smaller. And they're as thick as a pen sort of thing. Um, and they're very, yeah, it's usually the cats that are one thing they get brought in, so... Um, yeah, so I put that in just to show you there's, there's sort of a mimic cry going on there. All right, so I want you all... Um, I'll finish that up on the snakes now, because I know we're kind of at the end. Um, I do just want to check with you on the idea of first aid. So on the back of your booklets, which um, Tamika and Faye um, and a handful of people put together for you, with a, um, a reference to you. <laughs> on the back there is um, a first aid description. And I want you to think about a few things. In the event of snake bite, 
We just apply a compression bandage. Thank you. Did you move it? I am joking, from the blind guy. <laughs> so, every time we did have it on the back page. Uh, but it must be the. Okay. If it's on, on back page in your gut, yeah. it's on the yeah. back page. Yeah. That's right. It's a reverse practical joke. <laughs> All right. So on your back page, uh, this one obviously cut on. But on your back page, it will be a, a illustration that shows you about the compression bandage. Now, a lot of people get worked up, and I tend to stay in the zone of what it's like when you panic. You've got snake bite, and just pretend there's one that got bitten tonight. Um, a lot of things happen. So if you, you basically panic, you're worried about how to put the bandage on, do you put it on the start or say I got bitten on the finger? Do I start up the top? Do I start around here? My general suggestion is just put the bandage on. Uh, don't worry too much about all the fine details. When you're ringing, if someone's with you, they're ringing triple O, you're putting the bandage on. Does anyone know what's the idea of the compression bandage? Just slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah. Good. So the back system spreads, you know, a little, little bit slower than the arterial, which is really pumping it out, and your heart rate increases, and clearly even if you're going faster. That's one of the things. Um, originally, Dr. Sutherland um, came up with the technique because he was doing experiments at the time, and he was trying to work in a way to suppress the lymphatic system, and his little Apparently, one of these little um, devices broke, so he applied a bandage just to hold it in place until he could find a way to slow it down. And um, it actually worked so well that it became a technique that's commonly used. <coughs> Does have disadvantages, for sure, but generally, if the bite is in the skin and the lymphatic system, so it's not arterial. So, to give you an example, when I got bitten, I got bitten in the vein, and compression bands is not going to work for me. All right? But you still put it off. You do all the things you've got to do and you stay put, but you're putting the bandage on as firm as it for what? So if you put it on too tight, you'll basically, it'll start throbbing and it can actually hurt a bit. So you put it on as tight as if for a sprain. So when you're putting, you know how you put a very firm for a sprained ankle? It's that firm that we tend to go for. And sometimes put your finger and just check the bandage. It should just be nice and firm. Should be able to still put your finger under a it's fine. It's very hard because you'll be panicking, you'll be sweating, you'll be cursing, you'll be trying to be calm. It's really hard. So we talked about that calmness before. Just put the bandage on. Don't fiddle about all the little details. Some people say take wings off, take this, take that, take that. Take your jacket off, take your shirt off. I guess you take whatever you but the whole idea is that just put the bandage on. Spread the back system however you can. The idea is we want to buy you, and I'm going to say, uh, let's start and buy you three hours of time by putting a bandage on firmly around your arm. If you remain still, put a bandage on, I'm giving you the maximum amount of time before you need to that, if you had a serious bite with that. Does that make sense? So when you get up and start walking around, let's say this is your timeline here, and you drop it down. And then you decide to drive yourself to hospital. So your time of safety is dropping all the time. Everything you do that's wrong, it drops more and more. So if you do the basic, triple zero bandage, sit still, wait for the ambulance. I know you might be somewhere weird. There could be all sorts of things happening. It doesn't matter too much. You've got time because you're buying yourself time by doing everything correctly. Does that make sense? So the more that you do things like, oh, I'm going to drive myself to the hospital, all you're doing is just dropping this down. You then increase your chance of other issues, intracranial hemorrhages, um, big thing with brown snakes. I know I've said the brown snakes haven't caused death here, but when people are active and they keep moving, when a brown snake victim falls over and loses consciousness, usually significant. And I think Dr. Chris touched on it when he talked about animals collapsing neurotoxically. It's a dangerous, dangerous time. It means very hard to reverse with antivenom. Remember how we talked about tiger snakes? You can reverse it quite easily with antivenom. Okay, the, the way the neurotoxin attacks the nerve ending is different for brown. They tend to close it right up and wrap it up so antivenom doesn't quite get in there. Tiger tends to sort of like apply it quite loosely so it's easy for the antivenom to reverse it. So that's one of the dangers of brown snake bites. So we want to 
keep your maximum safety margin really high. Everything you do, spot on, keep it there. Everything that goes wrong, drops it down, less time, less time, you need antivenom now. You, right down here, you've got to rush into hospital, you need antivenom right now. You've used up too much of your time. And so everything has to go well from that point on. Doctors have to know what to do. The antivenom's got to be ready. They've got to do the test quickly. You're rushing everybody. Things go wrong when that happens. So by doing it this way, you have to keep yourself safer. Does that all make sense? And that can you know, work both ways. And antivenom gets given to you when you show shaman and then venomation seriously. So in my case, throwing up fruit loops everywhere and saying I feel awful. And I look awful, I have fruit loops all over my face. <laughs> and I uh, look like an alien. So um, don't eat fruit loops unless you really want to get bitten by a snake. <laughs> but the real deal is that um, everything that in my case was different because it went in the bloodstream, I was envenomated straight away, and a lot of things went wrong. I had an amazing team of people. That's the great thing about Australia. Even if the worst happens, our medical people are fantastic. And we are just so lucky. So even when things go wrong, they're trained to help you get out of it, okay? Any questions? I know I hit you with a lot. Hope you haven't scared you out of moving out of Bendigo. Simon, just so you know as well, we've had people online from Central Illinois in the US, Beautiful. Cyprus from uh, <coughs> uh, Queensland, uh, a few other places around. A lot of comments about how awesome the presentation was and how helpful the information has been to our Australian also overseas viewers. So, cool. yeah. Amazing. Thank you, well, thank you everybody overseas. <laughs> Reptile Rescue Rehab session tomorrow. Um, if anyone wants to register, just shoot us through an email. Uh, it's going to be a full day, so nine till four. Um, it's going to cover a lot of things, um, and Chris is going to be speaking again on the day, um, talking about. You want people to come? Up, so put them on. <laughs> <laughs> Says you <laughs> on TV. <laughs> Six stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and at the end of the day, um, for anyone that's interested, we're going to be doing some necropsies of specimens that we've collected over time. Um, and also, um, here. Yes. Yeah, 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 we'll be able to show you some um, some injuries and things like that. So, yeah. You're going to so, love that. Yeah. Are you going to have live animals? Hey? No, no, no live ones. No, we don't need them for tomorrow. It's really good. No, we we'll just hit you with information. Words. Bring on. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. On. <laughs> <laughs> He's done the rounds tonight, hasn't he? He's met everyone. But I don't know if he's going to come back to me. That's always a problem. Huh? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Down a, a, a new dog around. That's right. I'm training a, a big goanna to be my guide animal. Um, have a big goanna to guide me around. He's looking for the stats. I forgot to mention, there's also lollies up the back. Oh, wow. Look at all the lollies. Lollies, lollies, and rainforest. No worries. Are we seeing you tomorrow? Are we going to do Yeah. Yeah. Um, nothing. I've already said hello. Hey, man, how you doing? Yeah, good. Good, Nice to meet you.